I hope it's welcome back to everyone. Otherwise, we'll start, start again from, from the beginning. Um, so, um, I mentioned last week that this is going to be informal, and this one's going to be even less less formal because I've got a lot of stuff on Tuesdays, but I had a busy week. And um, where were we last week? What did we last? What, what was the what was the what was, what was the what was the theme of last week? I was finished. Good. I'm glad that came across because <laughs> it is actually again and again one of the things we're trying to do uh, just to, to recap. I, I would love to get some feedback. Uh, I do it, it, as to whether or not this stuff is actually useful. Um, a lot of stuff I'm drawing is uh, on is from the uh, introduction to statistical learning, but that book, um, which is an elementary book on the elements of statistical learning, and somewhere in the middle is where I think people want to be or should be. Um, I'm also trying to emphasize, because I have no idea of your backgrounds, and, and that I, I'm trying to emphasize the bits that I think aren't necessarily um, emphasized in other classes. But uh, one of the things, as I mentioned, we would like to, I, I think, um, and I'd like your feedback on this as to whether or not this is the sort of thing that people in PhD programs or in master's programs actually need to learn for their work. In statistics, I've having lengthy conversations recently about in statistics, we tend to teach a lot of math, and, and it is actually, it speaks for itself as long as you speak that language. <laughs> uh, but, uh, there are other people who just want to know how to use it in software, and I think there's a midpoint between the, that level of rigor and sort of abstractness and that level of, um, of utility. I think we want to go beyond just using it as a black box. Um, so it would be good to get feedback about what sort of things you actually need, what, le what levels, um, what bits you already know. I mean, that's very complicated. In, in a regular class, we have to what I'm trying to think about um, for a graduate certificate or for a designated emphasis or whatever um, with different audiences, it would be really good to know how to calibrate this stuff. Uh, I can just give any feedback. Like I say, it'd be, it's different than if you were actually reading stuff before you came to class, you're not. So it's just kind of a random free for all. Um, so, bias variance trade off. And I will uh, mention again, I mean, this notion of actual very elementary univariate statistics of the variance of x plus y is equal to the variance of x plus the variance of y plus twice the covariance, and if the covariance is positive, okay, the variance goes up is actually a key idea that we saw last time. So, correlated estimates of your test and uh, mean squared error, and in the, the, the whole concept, once you get past bootstrapping, okay, if we looked, we looked at random forests, we looked at, okay, we have this concept of actually bootstrapping. Separate models to, add, to simulate, or to sort of, to simulate the idea of resampling. Then, okay, that was a good idea. That gave us ensembles. That gave us a collection of things that we averaged, and averaging is good, so they would actually reduce the variance. But they didn't reduce the variance in the case of the random bar, uh, the, the case of bag. Why not? How did we do that? Some, throwing out some information. Oh, what information? Now, it's all about throwing out some information, including more information, and, and getting a handle on this bias variance. I think can be, I think, can be very helpful. How you actually trade it off? So, I mean, basically, we said there's a trade-off. We can increase the bias and, and decrease the variance. We can increase the variance. And we can do the opposite. There's a sweet spot. How you find it is another matter. So, what information do we throw out? Way in the in, in Random forests provide one extra layer of them bagging and bootstrap aggregation. And the bootstrap aggregation is just, just taking lots of samples from our original sample, and we get lots of models. So those are, so yeah, so some, what was the difference? So it was predictive, right, because all those models are all very correlated. And that was, again, the whole point of this is just to reduce the correlation. It just seems like that. So Leo Brian, and Professor Dan Berkeley, and I like that. I like my other PhD students. He invented random forests a lot at the same time. But the, uh, but you know, that it, to some extent, that is the one big idea in random forests is just throw away information, predictors, throw away predictors, which seems like a very odd idea. But it is, it goes back to the very simple concept that you're trying to reduce. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're holding that constant. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, all, all, so much of this goes away if you change, you know, you've got all these different parameters. So, one of the things is 
I, uh, <laughs> sample size improves your test MLC. What, 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 what do we, what do we reduce? Bias or variance? Mm -hmm. hmm? Variance. Okay. So bias is kind of fixed. Bias is the structural piece our model is incapable of getting. So when we actually get to a, when we, and again, hopefully this, I, I, I worry that this, I'm terrified this is all completely obvious. Couple times, I go, I'm also teaching a class at the moment, and none of it's obvious at all. <laughs> it makes me anxious, but you know, when we have, when this is our truth, and we're fitting a model that looks like this, we just can never get closer to the truth. No matter how much sample, can we increase the sample size. All we're doing is, is anchoring this line down. Or we're, we're, we're really capable of actually getting to the, this, this, this feature of that model with a simple linear model. Okay, whereas clearly, if, you know, if we have, if, if I'm just, if I've got two points and I'm fitting a line, that's not so good, but if I get, but if I'm fitting, but if I'm fitting, if I'm fitting a quadratic equation here, so x1 plus x1 squared here, in my regression model, I'm able to get to this with more observations. It, the variance is going down. It's kind of weird, I've only got two observations, I can't even fit this, so I have a bit of a quadratic, but once I get past enough points, all we're doing now is actually, if I'm fitting the right model, Okay, if I'm fitting this model, I'm going to converge towards the truth. I'm not going to overfit because I've got the truth. The bias is going to be zero. Okay, if I fit just x1 here, this is x1, this is y. If I just fit this, I'm constantly just fitting a line. There's no way I can ever get that, that extra feature. That's, you know, unfortunately, we use the term bias, and it's totally obvious what it means. We use other terms, and it's not obvious what it means, uh, and yet it's a common enough term. But that's all. So if we can increase the uh, sample size, it ain't bias. It's just, it's just variance. I'm, what I'm basically saying is, how do you do that? How do you fix the bias, or how do you deal with bias variance? You increase the sample size. The answer is you always increase the sample size, but that's not a given. <laughs> you, know, you can't do that. So, and likewise, building down trees, let's hold them constant. The complexity level at a uh, uh, constant, then we can talk about these other other aspects. Because as you grow down, what happens when you grow a tree down? What's going on there? Seeing as I seem to only have one theme I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, I only have one theme. So what's happening when you actually grow a tree? Remember the trees we actually had the last time? I went through this picture. I'm very happy to go through any of them again. You know, we basically have a, we have a tree, which is, here's all my data, we, can, we find the best split, the best univariate predictor, okay, our classifier, and we sort of say everyone who's, everyone who's got blood pressure less than this number goes to the left, everyone, goes to, everyone else goes to the right, and we, we continue to divide this down. Hopefully, so what, what's happening as I grow the tree in terms of bias variance? <coughs> We're reducing bias? Until when? Okay, until we overfit. Then what's happening? Okay, now we get now we now we're fitting individual data points. So there's going so that and again the variance. So never explained to me probably the variance comes if I get a different sample, I will end up with a different tree. And even that I find complicated. Okay, because if that says the tree will change, but not the actual predictions, which is really weird. They probably will change. If we get right down to where there's only one observation in each node, and so, you know, and now this this flips from being male to female just by chance, based on the other x the x's that we're doing. So we're now we're ending up with a different y, that literally a different y than we would have gotten. Then we get confused variance. But the, but sometimes the sometimes the variability of the tree doesn't matter. The prediction stays the same. So that's not the same variance. In the predict that we're getting, but the, so the, the stability of the trees is different, but they are, but it's inherently related to the instability of uh, uh, the, 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 the increased variance. So as we go down, you, so you keep going down, you keep going down, and, you, and you're, you're, you're going from better, better, better. So it's just like here, as we go from x1 to x1 squared, we get to x cubed, and this is the quadratic. We're over there, and now we're actually increasing. Now the bias, the bias is. Actually, come back up a little bit in some regards, but it's flexible enough to deal with. But now we're just introducing variance. Why are we introducing variance? 
if we do this, if I actually fit to this quadratic, if I have x1 of beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x1 squared plus beta 3 x cubed, Again, there's two different types of variances going on in my mind, and it's hard to pull apart. And every time I read a book, they always talk about variance and never tell us which type, but they rarely talk about exactly which one they're talking about. Even in introduction to statistical learning, they were talking about, well, this method reduces the variance <laughs> of oh, what? Because <laughs> there's a whole load of things going on here. Yeah? It, it seems if you get to a point where you have you can have a, a parameter for every single data point, and you add in one more data point, the entire shape of it could just go all along the chain. So there's the but so that that's what's happening with overfitting. We're literally overfitting, and, and you know we get we get a data point, we get a data point here, we get a data point here, we get a data point here. Life is great. In, you know, we get a we get a, a norm, we, If this were normal, okay, so we have it there. We could easily get a point over here. In which case now this becomes a straight line. So seeing the beta hats are changing what? Okay, that's what we're basically saying. That's one of the questions. We're basically saying that the beta hats will change. Okay, but also we're basically saying y is equal to this plus an error, which also means that the variance of y is changing. Is that right? And the variance of y is just the, the sum of these variances now. It's beta zero squared, beta one squared times the variance of x. Okay, this is constant, so that doesn't matter. Beta two x two. So there's the, there's the actual variance of y is written like this. That's going to change. There's also y minus y hat, which is slightly different. Okay, when we put these in, this is all changing. There's a lot of variances going on. We can't actually say which one we're talking about. But they, and they, all, they all seem to be going in approximately the same direction. They're all, we're controlling them slightly differently. But basically, you know, one of the things to know here, over here, you know, as we add in more stuff that doesn't explain why, we haven't talked about progression so much, but it's the same classification. As we add more here, we're literally just adding in variability with no explanation. Yeah? I think you just answered my question. I was going to ask you how this variance increases with the hats. So I assume you mean that as we add in more data hats, that's causing the increase? I'm just saying if you write down this model, if you just write down this, this, this uh, if you just write down this stochastic equality, which is y is equal to this. When we put in beta hats here or not, what's, going to, what's actually going on here is you know, just, just as we wrote down the covariance of x plus y is equal to the, co the variance of x, the variance of this guy is the same. The variance of, the, of these is just the variance of x plus the variance of y plus twice the covariance. And you said that covariance can hurt you if they're, if they're positively correlated. Likewise, we're, just, we're adding in terms here. So there's a penalty here to adding in nonsense, you know, because the because it's got some variability. If you just look at the y, there's this inherent variability. Okay, uh, and then also this thing. Now this is the, this is the this is the mean squared error. This is the difference. But this is just for y. Just here, there's more variability if it's made up of some of terms. It depends on whether or not these are greater than one or not, and so forth. It depends on how these are correlated with each other. That's important. So oh, there's a whole lot of variance going on in y. Okay, and then. There's a whole variance going on in y minus y hat because here we got y varies, y hat varies because as the sample changes, y hat changes. Okay, so there's lots of different things going on, and that's essentially all we're trying to do with machine learning is trying to figure out how to actually get the get the right answer with, and, and minimize the variance as well, increasing the sample size is great. So I mean, this is the as I was saying, the bias variance trade off is is I know, what I kept on talking about last week. <laughs> This was, the, this was the magic equation that says basically you can't do better than measurement error. If there's inherent variability in per person, you're, you're just not going to be able to do better than that. Okay? But it's also the variability of your predictor and then bias of your predictor. Okay? And if we look at these, we can trade this off. Okay? And it, this is the magic piece of this thing. You have y here, y minus y hat. That is either for your test set or your training set. Or what? But we actually care about the test set. Okay, we care about predicting it for the future. Okay, not not based on the training set. So that's that becomes critical. And then we actually needed to uh, find a mechanism to actually minimize that trading trading off the bias and the various and the variance as as we see fit. And and we never know the truth, so we can actually figure out which those pieces are. And then we did actually. So the other thing I talked about was cross validation. 
that was the other thing that I should have come across, which is uh, I, I, I went across on this because I can understand it's extremely heuristic, uh, you know, intangible. Everyone knows that very good. It's a concrete algorithm that you can actually wrap your head around as opposed to math, and it doesn't have as many assumptions. Although, as I mentioned, you can get yourself seriously wrong if you sample incorrectly, or more to the point, and I'll reiterate this, you're trying to understand the error, the total error in your procedure, which means if you've got a multi-step procedure that actually selects things, then fits, you better cross-validate the entire process as opposed to getting your, selecting your subset of variables and then go okay now I cross something because you're not in, you're not building in the total repeatability uh, uh, the, the total sort of the, the randomness that comes from getting different predictors as those things come in so and likewise if you've got this complicated data set where you actually <laughs> when you're actually looking at time series something you better actually a cross something where you've got a random sample as opposed to just looking at it in looking at January and trying to predict the rest of the year. But you also, if, it, if it's a nested structure, you better figure that out. And so in other words, if, you're, if you've got things that are correlated, observations that are correlated for, in a structural way and you're not sampling with respect to that structure, you are, you're getting uh, the wrong, an estimate of the wrong thing. And that's really problematic. So what else did we do last week? <laughs> so, so we, 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 I, I focused on classification because I find I find that the, the at least the regression is so overwhelmingly well taught uh, that it, it, it's, it's most. Of it. So maybe we saw LDA and QDA for discriminant analysis. We saw k nearest neighbors. What else did we see? We saw classification trees. Did anyone have any questions on these? Or was it all so clear? Or was it all so wrong? <laughs> or different aspects? What else did we look at? Make me take out my notes. <laughs> right. That was the lead one I cross validation, which was so the, the, this was cross validation, which was our which was, in my opinion, the mechanism that the, the one guaranteed mechanism of actually getting the an answer of our what's our test. What's our mean squared error on, 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 a, on essentially a test test data? This is cross validation. We also saw the bootstrap, which was, I, was met, I was mentioning for two reasons. One is it's a really handy way when, if you remember what I was asking, was what the actual uh, standard, what's the confidence interval for the 95th quantile? And I asked you, and yeah, I can't remember if we got an answer, but we, we kind of needed to know what the distribution of the x's were. I don't think that's a problem we don't know. And we can stick it into formulas that don't actually apply except for when n gets larger and larger so under many circumstances we can bootstrap and that was a good thing so again it's kind of like cross validation it's a hands-on uh, constructive way of actually generating confidence intervals where we actually sample it so we actually talked about we said that there was a parametric version and a non-parametric version which was better Pardon? Depends. <laughs> I love statistics. <laughs> <laughs> I never say anything useful. <laughs> so it, it depends. If we know the truth is winning, and this is going to be the case with regression too, if you know the truth, or if you're confident that you actually are correct and that you have very little bias, then, then, then you're going to you're borrowing a huge amount of information. You're getting more complete randomness in here because you're actually sampling from the true distribution. Whereas if I'm sampling from individual observations, I can never see these points in here, okay? Which means that I don't quite get the same variability. I get it, I get it enough, but it's not, it's not going to be quite correct. If this is the wrong distribution, clearly I'm actually misleading myself. And in many cases, it doesn't actually matter. Okay, so where else were we? So these were the things. Uh, okay, so that's, okay. So these are things on the so so can you say it's likely to raise your classification trees. We talked quickly about logistic regression, which we're gonna come back to a little bit today, okay? Which was just because it connects to regression, I was trying to connect up, trying to leave regression out of things. But these are the other things we saw, the ensembles. 
Okay, this was the thing that we talked about with, with the bagging and the random farms. Okay, so it was so it was this notion of bagging, which is we will actually why stick to one model? Let's use multiple models. <coughs> How do I get multiple models? I can choose two radically different models, but I can also actually fit the same model over and over again to to bootstrap uh, bootstrap samples of my data. Okay, and then I average these together. That is reducing the variance. So we have variance in these trees. So what do I do? I reduce the variance by averaging together. Okay, then I reduce the correlation through random forests, okay, using this dropping things out, and that's good. And then the last thing we talked about was this, public boosting. Is fitting the stuff more than discounting the stuff you fit well and emphasizing the stuff you didn't and fit again. Then averaging those. Yep. So it's ensembles again. Okay, we're going to fit a bunch of models. Okay, is this clear to everyone? Over here, I'll tell you. So again, it's, it's kind of a nice, simple idea. I like the heuristics behind all these. The math is there too. Even the math isn't particularly hard for this. But basically, what do we what do we do? So in in in, ba in bagging and random forests, what do we got? We got we fit a model. We fit model one up to model B. Okay, or by bootstrap samples we construct, and then off we go. We Take um, we, we, each of these comes from a bootstrap sample. Okay, the beauty one of the nice things about this. So we end up with okay, a M1 star, M star B. Okay, life is great, and we just average. Okay, we just average over the MIX. So we're going to predict. So our prediction for a version of X is just going to be the prediction through here. We just average. Do we just average? Why not? This is for the bootstrap. This is for this is for bagging. What can we do? We can wait. If we actually do now again, this is just a really elementary concept. Okay, and again, I'm, I'm introducing it. I wanted the bootstrap over here because I think it is a very useful technique for actually you know, if you're not good at math, it gets you out it gets you out of problems. If you're not very good at actually knowing the truth, it gets you out of problems. Okay, it gets you again as I mentioned. It, if two answer, if two different techniques that are supposed to give you the same answer do not give you qualities in the same answer, you've got a problem. Maybe you actually got a problem that you can actually look at the differences between them and learn more. But if they don't agree, it's a problem. You should be you should be uh, concerned, and that's why it's nice to have another technique. Here, if we actually use weights, what weight should we use? You put a weight, you should, the weighted averages should be better under what circumstances? Yeah, this is just. Oh, come on. Lower the variance. The lower the variance, the higher the weights, and vice versa. Yeah. So we'll actually weight this, we'll put the weights as being proportional, as being proportional to 1 over sigma squared of, 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 of i. Okay? So if we if the predictions come out here with confidences or or standard errors, we might as well actually use those to if we if we believe them, we we should actually wait by this. Okay, that's and that's just but back again to this notion that um, that the variance of x plus the variance of y by put weights on them one minus alpha. How do I okay? And I'm going to put this, so these add up to one. So how do I actually, how do I, how do I minimize this? There's a reason I'm asking this question. <laughs> and I don't need, I don't need you to stand up and actually go through all the math. Just tell me the magic, tell me the magic thing. This is the same thing basically saying, what's the, same question, the sum of the variance of xi here, put a weight, put a weight on them. Weight sum. Okay, and I'm going to I'm going to insist that the sum of the weights is equal to one. I, will, I do not want them to be more than one, otherwise I can just make them hundred and I just get an estimate of hundred times my answer. Okay, this is useless. So I'm going, put, I'm going to put restrictions on this. So I'm going to actually I want to I want to minimize the variance subject to this silly constraint, which just makes sense. Subject to this constraint, how do I solve that? 
Normalize it? How do I normalize? Normalize what? Sure, but, that's, but I need to find out what the WIs are. You know the answer. If you're telling me to stick in the answer, and then you get the answer. That's not, that's you. <laughs> How did I get the answer? How did I find out that the best Ws here, the best Ws here are proportional to 1 over sigma squared i, sigma squared i, where sigma squared, where the xi's are distributed with some distribution of this variance. How did I, how did I do this? Who could remember that elementary math? It's not so elementary, but it's, it's I never know what people saw. I didn't go to school in this country, so I don't know what people this, this is something we're minimizing, yes? So we're minimizing this subject to this constraint. What is that? What term is that written in my mind? Is it programming? And then you're programming into your programming these sort of things. It's subject to a constraint. Or alternatively, this is continuous. There's no integers here. So what's the other one? Hmm? I thought I heard something. What was it? Hello, <laughs> <Colin> no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is a, a Lagrange multiplier problem. Okay, we have a constraint. Okay, so we actually have to build a constraint in. And we have to, that's an extra set of equations that we get. So we take the derivative with respect to the W's here. Okay, so we get uh, we get this, and we know that these guys add up. We take the derivative here for seven equals zero. Simple optimization problem that you did in calculus. Okay, except for it's got constraints. <laughs> There's a reason I tell you that. Okay, <laughs> uh, okay, we'll come back. Okay, but it, 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 you can walk through. If you actually go, if you if you Google. If you Google minimize, if you, if you look at, if you Google weighted average minimum variance, it'll take you to the three lines on Wikipedia that actually show you this. They want what it is. So if it's not really covariance, it doesn't matter. They're independent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they're independent. So, okay, they're not identically distributed because they have different variances. I'm going to make life easier by saying that they're not smaller covariance. Yes, otherwise, that would be okay. You just let me have a multivariate problem. We can do the same thing, absolutely, quite right. But this is what we do in statistics. We go, oh, that's a hard problem. That's simple. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, but, so weighting again, if we weight by something that's proportional to the, the uh, inverse of the variance, life is good. And then we just, so by proportional means we just take all these weights and then we divide by the sum of those so the add up to one and life is fine. Why do I tell you this? Because it turns out to be useful. Okay. So, okay, so this was, this was just the bagging. The boosting, for this, by the way, the order in which we do this makes no difference whatsoever. Okay, these are completely independent of each other by design. This sample should be totally independent of this sample. They should have overlap because certain observations will be in. There will be correlation between them because of the presence. But the way we sample the observation being, if an observation is in here, it's, it's just, we know nothing about it being in here. Okay, they're, 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 these are independent. Of each other, there they're done in parallel if you want. But now over here on the back on the boosting front, and this is a cute idea that sort of came back in the mid nineties, okay, and then people figured out what it was doing, okay. But the boosting is is different, okay. We fit one model, okay, and then we look at the results, okay. Then we look at the residuals. And you can do one of two different, you can explain this one of two different ways. You take your pick. I'm doing it so heuristically, you can't pin me down on the details. It's written in, it, the, both, both, both versions I think are written in ISLR. Okay, M1, you take the residuals. Okay, the ones that were bad, you increase their weights. A, this is one of the reasons I like weights to be squares and stuff like that. You kind of need to know some of this stuff. The reason I want to know about the Lagrange multipliers is nothing to do. That's how you solve this, but we're going to use it for solving something else. But weighting is good. It reduces variance, and that's what we want to do. We're assuming the bias is fixed. So the residuals that you that you get back, the observations that you get back on, you increase their weight. You then normalize the weights again. Okay. And there's a formula for how you might do this, and then you fit model two using the weights. 
using same data, so totally different from here. Same data, okay, but new weights. So now you've got another, you've got another model, which is really not a good model because it's chasing the bad stuff. And it's probably not doing very well on what it did well on, what M1 did. We're basically saying, go after the bad guys, don't worry about the good guys, which means this model should actually be worse overall. Which means, when we continue doing this all the way down to MB, okay, we just repeat the same thing, constantly chasing the next guy. Okay, then what we've got, we've got these M1 to MB models again. They're kind of, they're, wandering around looking at different parts of the fit, the space that they're trying to fit. This one is probably the best. This one's probably the second best, third best, there's no, no, no guaranteed order. But basically then what we do is we put a weight on this, a weight on this, and a weight on this, and we average our predictions, okay? So this guy, which did really well on some really, really bad observations, okay? So we increase the weights on very, very few observations, fit those very well, this guy has very low weight overall, but it does get to contribute something. So it actually helps in getting into those weird parts of the model that we couldn't do quite well. So it actually gets, gets, gets some of the bias that we might have actually had, but it, 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 it's low weight, so these other guys come in. If you do this on regression, another way of thinking about this, boosting regression, is the same idea. It's that you take the residuals, you can explain it in, in almost the same way, but instead of increasing the weights, what you do is you look at the residuals. Okay, so I mean, it kind of seems weird. We'll go back. We'll go back to it in a second. But what you can think about doing is you fit model one, and you get the residuals. Okay, these are your residuals one through n. And then what you actually do is you start modeling the residuals. Okay. So now you model the residuals and in terms of the other variables, okay? And you get a new set of residuals, and you keep going, and you keep going, and you weight accordingly in the same way. What are you trying to do here? You're trying to basically go after the bit that you didn't model well in the, in the first model with, with what, whatever's left over. So there is structure left over. And the bit that always strikes me as odd about this is why would there ever be structure left over in the first model? Right. Bias? Well, why don't you just stick extra variables in there to account for the bias? I mean, we, we're, we're taught in regression that basically, you know, there shouldn't be, when you look at the residuals and you see this, you're missing a term. <laughs> okay? And so the boosting is the boosting is kind of a special case here. Isn't it? We're not fitting a, a really good model in step one. If you remember what I said last week, I didn't. Uh, okay, which is rare. <laughs> the, uh, but this case was a weak learner. This was only this was doing only a little bit better than random guessing. So these are actually very simple and cheap models. Okay, they're not particularly powerful. They're not fitting massive trees and 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 doing an awful lot of work to actually do the fitness. They're taking reasonably simple models and then actually making up for them and actually progressively wandering around the space and actually fixing up the pieces. So here we're basically saying, you got a simple model, you're only using one or two variables here. Next time around, the next iteration that we build on this, we look at the residuals and model them and see what bits we're missing. And then we get a second shot, which is very different. It's a radically different view of the world. It turns out that the loss function that you're playing with here, okay, if you think about what we're trying to minimize, you're trying to minimize y minus y hat in this case. The truth, you know, this is the test and then see you're minimizing a loss function and the loss function you tend to be minimizing looks like this on the soft threshold. They're very similar to things we actually know about. But it, it's it's a way we do boosting can get you regression this way where you're just chasing the residuals. Another interpretation, the original data boost was that you're increasing the weights on these things. They all seem sensible. The reason I mention this is this is it, this is actually what we're trying to minimize. It's a function that actually has slightly different characteristics. So they will end up with slightly different optimum values. 
slightly different values for the beta or for the overall loss. And they will get lead to slightly different solutions. Slightly different solutions, but that can be important. Okay? So this is my little note about this, just to remind me. Weighted average. Okay, it's fine. Okay. Um, so th that was that was the that was, these are the ensembles. I I think the ensembles are an actual pretty clever idea to actually start thinking about and actually putting them into your arsenal. There's different methods, but they don't you can actually use them because of, as I tried to describe them. You know, you can use weights, these MIs, they're on the boot in the in the bootstrapping or in the boosting. We know how to construct them. There's no reason why we can't actually use two totally different models, two different methods and average them. Perfectly fine. Life is good. Does, is everyone here on hope line? I don't know, but everyone happy with confusion matrices? Everyone know what a confusion matrix is? No? How many people don't? Okay, enough. Okay, excellent. I wasn't sure. I have no idea. I would say, when I look at a class, when I, when I teach a class, I can look at what classes everyone's taken, I can see what background they have. You guys just wander in. <laughs> no idea what I'm doing. Okay, uh, as to what people actually know. So, compute, so how do we actually evaluate classification? We're gonna, we're gonna come back to this, by the way, this Lagrange multipliers, okay? Constrained, constrained optimization. Okay, actually, let me do one. Actually, uh, how are we? I mean, let me do one more thing. Okay, let me just do one thing before we get to the, how we how we look at all of these different things. There's one other thing that we didn't mention. One other classifier that people love. What is it? What do we have here? We have again ensembles here. Okay, so that gave us boosting, gives bagging, random forests. Okay, then there's one other method that we actually use, which you can do, you can plug in here. These are kind of basically techniques that we use that are, if you use any of these, what people tend to use, at least. There's this other thing called a support vector machine, which I don't believe we mentioned at all, actually. Did we? We did? Did I explain it? When I say mention, I mean, we talk about it like something. I want to mention it once, and I'm not going to talk about support vector machines today. It's, it's kind of weird. <laughs> We ran out of time. So here's the very, here is the very simple idea. Uh, and I kind of want to bring it back to I'm going to connect it up to here. There is a, some logic. Again, they're, they're, not, they're not very tightly connected, but I just want, want you to see some of the simple features. Yes, but your first is for it. Thank you. That sounds like a good plan. It's also easier if we actually have pen that actually works yellow for strange colors. So here's the very, we looked we look at <laughs> yeah. So we looked at this. Okay, so we, we this is the same picture. Okay, that we we saw last week. I know we did this one. Okay, so you got two. We, all, we always talk about binary classification because it's so much easier. Certain things are easy to do with multi-class, but binary just always works. How do you find a classifier for those? For I got three. I got three. I got two variables. Okay, x1, x2, and my third variable is, are you red or are you blue? What is the, which technique will we use? <laughs> it's just true. Okay, okay. And that, that's easy. But, the, but the, the obvious thing, which is what LDA is going to do, remember, linear discriminant analysis. This, by the way, is kind of hinged upon the idea of, of Bayes' theorem. Likelihood ratios, if they're normal, the whole thing collapses down to being a nice, simple uh, linear term in X for multivariate normal. If, they, if the variances are different for your two, if this group, if, if I were to draw this group and I, would, and I did this, okay, it would still be simple, but we now would need quadratic discriminant analysis because. A covariance structure like one x two, but this group is very different from this group. These will lead to okay. These will lead to uh, boundaries that look like that. Okay, in quadratic discriminant analysis, these are the these are the cutoff boundaries. Right? If we go above, if we go over this side, we say you're blue. If we go over this side, we say you're red. So these these boundaries should should meet at some point. 
Okay, and then that's where we actually say where you are. Life is good. Okay, everyone with me? These are the boundaries we've been looking at. When we had k nearest neighbors, we ended up with boundaries that looked like this. Okay, and because we're always going to say, well, at this point, I'm closer. I'm, I've got k and three neighbors. I get two from here, one from here. If I were to move a slight bit, the neighbors would jump, and I would end up with a different prediction. So this is the boundary we would get for k nearest neighbors. It's very, very, um, case I just drew there, it's kind of jagged, not smooth. So it's kind of very variable, okay? But it's got, but it's probably too wiggly, okay? Depending on what we want, so why it's there straight up. This is fine. Linear discriminant analysis now won't work because of these. We need multivariate normal. But clearly, simplest mechanism for this is, if you forget about any math, what's the obvious way to classify these two groups? Draw a line. <laughs> or, or to jump, jump. <laughs> Draw a line. Which line? It's a very simple idea. I like. I, I just like this. I like the construction of this. This line. They're all fine. They're all perfectly good lines. Which one? What, which line would you like? Oh no! I only want one line. I need one line. I don't. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not these guys vote. <laughs> which line do I like? The average of all the lines. <laughs> The, uh, the average of all the lines. No, no, no. We want the criterion that actually is, is it may be the average, but I want the criterion that, that, that actually gives me the line of the best. I mean, what about this one? Just one that maximizes the distances between the points. See, this one, this one is not good because, you know, I, if, I, if I just get a point here, I'm wrong. And it's not that, it's not that bad. You know, it's really not very far away. Okay? Especially if I get another. Especially if I get a, a new sample and I'm likely to get this point over here, it's not a big deal. But also, I'm just more comfortable if I put it here, I'm this far away, I'm that far away, and the bigger that gap is, the more comfortable I am. Yeah, because essentially, this is this is measured with some with some error. Okay, and the, and the further I am away from the average, okay, when the, where this line is, okay, the better life is. So this we call this m the margin. Okay, I basically going to split the margin in two, so we basically want, we're going to find the line that cuts through this, which actually keeps these guys as far apart as possible. And, okay, is that clear? As to why just intuitively we want the biggest gap as opposed to one really huge gap and a and very small gap. That may not be true, by the way, and again, I'm going back here. If I don't care about these, getting these guys wrong, I, I will, I am I'm under pain of death, I don't want to get these wrong, I may change my criteria, okay, for the, for the error. And this is where the loss function comes in. You have to decide what the loss function is. I just said over here, the different loss function will give you slightly different results. You get to choose the loss function. And unfortunately, I think everyone gives that right up because they don't understand it, or they just say, well, the nice software that handles this for us, so I will use a generic loss function. Some of the LDA, QDA classification trees, some of the these two, they actually handle the costs of being wrong, or you said, you know, get this wrong, it will cost you 25 times more than it will cost you here. If we can build those in, people often don't because they don't know what the costs are, but, it, it, but sometimes we will change it. But that's assuming that the costs are equal, which they rarely are, we're just going to maximize this, okay? So, uh, let me actually hang on a second. Let me just do this. I don't think I put them in here yet. So let's just do the following. How do I get rid of this silly thing? <sighs> Zoom. Uh, sorry, I just need to just do one little thing. Let me just do this. Sorry, one second. I'm just going to do the following. What did I call this? There's a reason I'm doing this. <laughs> Okay, support package. Okay, okay. So we're gonna. Here's what. Here's the way we're gonna mathematically set this up. And I hope it's the math is not complicated here. And if it is, just don't worry about it. It's just the heuristics of this. It, I, I, 
I think it actually helps. One of the ways of actually doing this, and there's a reason why I'm showing you this again, I'm trying to sort of put these all together. I don't think, hopefully, if things aren't clear, please yell. Hopefully the heuristics here are enough to understand what's going on and that the software do from one to the next. Quick question, uh, would the descriptor duration be pretty much the same boundaries as the point of duration? Well, maybe. <laughs> it's not going to get there in a moment. Okay? Because um, this is the line. So, so you see, this, the trouble with this, if I, if I go, let me take this picture. Okay? That will probably get me the right answer. The regression, because the regression for this and the regression for this are parallel, yeah? So therefore, when I split the difference, I will magically get the right answer. As long as there's an equal number in each group, and that they actually are correct, and that the variances are under really, really ideal assumptions of equal numbers in each group in the sample, and exactly the same variances like we had over an LDA, I might get the right answer. But I drew this over here, so now when I start doing the regression here, that regression line is here, this one is here, and Lord knows what the heck's going on in there. So the, and the reason that they're different is because I'm actually trying to minimize that totally different thing. I'm trying to actually minimize this, which is, to, I'm trying to maximize actually the margin between the points in the different groups. Whereas over here, I'm trying to minimize, when you do the regression, I'm trying to minimize the sum of squares, the, the mean square error, the y minus y hat. Okay, so they're totally different loss functions. They lead to quite different results. Okay, and what's weird is, you know, if, if I hadn't drawn this way, I might have said, yeah, yeah, you get the same answer. Then, no, no, hands out, do it this way. You're like, you're going to get different answers, and you have to go through all the different scenarios. Well, that's the inherent assumption. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's say this is a good example where you're like, here, hang on a second, these guys have a positive correlation, these guys have, have uh, sorry, negative correlation, these have a positive correlation, so I'll probably end up with a line <laughs> that just goes right down the middle and terrible, flat, or whatever. Um, okay, so bad news will happen. So it's, they're very different criteria that I'm trying to optimize, okay? So which line? So we said it's a line, because we only deal with lines. We're not very good at anything else, okay? The good news is we have a trick for getting beyond the line. They're okay, but we still call them lines. Okay, and here's the idea. We could, we're going to create, uh, let's see, turn here, so it's awesome. okay. We only have two outcomes, plus or minus one, not one and zero, plus or minus one, for, for a good reason, okay? I'm going to try to find this line by actually finding beta zero plus beta one times x one, okay, plus beta two times x two. That's the line. I don't know what the betas are. I have to chase those around. I'm going to minimize some or maximize some criteria, which is this, this margin. I'm going, to, I'm going to let that define everything, okay? But, okay? but I'm going to do it in a particular way, okay? I think I have it over here, okay? Oh, I hate math jacks. Okay, so basically, here's what we're going to actually do. This is all messed up, so I could fix it there. But again, don't worry about the math. Just worry about the, what, the, what, what the intent of the lines are, okay? Here's what we're going to do. We're basically just going to maximize the margin. I want to agree with this. I've got betas here. I'm going to maximize the margin. I'm going to move this line and wiggle the line around. For least squares, it's a closed form solution. But if, what, if we couldn't do the math for least squares, we'd actually move the betas around until we got the minimum, okay? Here, we, here it's not a closed form solution. Far from it. Okay, we're going to actually move this around and find out how well we do on it. In on maximizing M, but I can't just maximize M. Okay, it's going to be subject to. Okay, this is a silly one. Okay, beta zero plus beta one squared plus beta two squared. I think the square root of that, and that's equal to one. Just trust me, it does good things. Okay, most importantly. Most importantly, because I can move that around and I can, I can multiply them all by different numbers and all sorts of things. This is just this is a condition we put on to make it unique. But importantly here, it's got one more condition. It says I can actually measure the distance between this line and that point. Okay? Okay? Yeah, the result I'm going to get is actually the thing I want. Okay? So this is all next. Okay? So what are we actually going to do? That's one constraint. The other constraint is simply this. I'm just going to compute yi, this is plus or minus one, yeah? 
times beta 0 plus beta 1 times x1 plus beta 2 times x2. Okay? If this, okay, if, if for a value of x, I'm above the line, okay, that will be positive. Okay, I'm above this line, it will be positive. So y1 times one, positive number times yi is positive. If I'm below the line, this will be negative, and I will be blue, which is negative, negative one, which means this will be positive. Okay? That's the trick I'm going to use here to actually make this nice mathematical thing that I'll um, fix in the notes. Okay? Basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to, okay, I want everyone to be on the right side of the line. Yeah? Everyone happy? That's, that's enough to actually solve this problem. Okay? I just, I put this silly constraint on, don't worry about that. Okay? Okay? And I just, I'm subject to this yi times the, uh, times the actual predicted value, but I'm below the line or above the line. Okay, where are my relatives? The line will give me the answer. Okay, everyone happy? Does everyone believe me that that will give me the maximum margin? I told you, I'm maximizing the margin. I actually chase this around. I move the betas around. I keep doing this for days until I find the maximum of n. Where this is true, I never even try values for which this is not true. And, I make sure, and, then I, and then I have, this is true for all of them. And it's clearly possible because I can separate these out. Yes, everyone happy? Yes, I'm getting blank faces, which means too elementary or too confusing. Or half, half, for, half, half for one group, half for the other group. Other group. Okay. But basically, this is what we do, and don't worry about the math. We're just going to search around. The reason we, well, we can do this is we have math mathematicians. Who know who spend their life figuring out how to optimize functions. And we have a different function, but we may know how to optimize this cleverly, or we just throw a whole lot of computing out. It turns out we can actually do this reasonably. Okay, we set it up, we put these constraints on to make our life easier, but also for just so we can solve the problem, but also for interpreting. Everyone happy? We end up with this, and that's the fine, and that's what we get. We, we can clearly separate these guys out. Everyone happy? This is a support vector, okay? The, the point that is closest to the, to the line that we get, here's the margin, here's the gap between this. There's gonna be, it's, it's gonna, there's gonna be a tunnel down here of, of width 2m, okay? We do this, life is good, okay? The guy who is sitting right on that margin, look, if, if there's nobody sitting on the margin, I can the margin there. Okay, somebody's got to sit on the margin. Okay, it's either on this side or this side or both sides. These are called support vector machines. No, sorry, these are not called support vector machines, they're called support vectors. Okay, they're called, they, these are the actual vectors that support the, the actual tube, okay, the gap between these things. And if we change the sample, their things will move around a little bit. Hopefully, this will be stable. Doesn't matter, by the way, if I put a point of camera. <laughs> Don't do that. Okay, if I put a point up here, if I get a bunch of observations up here, so this is no longer normal, but it's now ridiculous, okay, it doesn't, it's not as effective by means, okay, because we only need the nearest point. It's somewhat stable, okay, it's still, you're still, you're still looking at a minimum, and clearly it depends on these points in the sense these ones are closer than these ones. It's all relative. But when these guys are complete outliers, we're actually in reasonable good shape. The bad news is, Hannah's cheated. This is an extremely simple problem. <laughs> Here, find the gap between these things, and it doesn't really matter what you do. Okay, you can do anything because they're far enough apart. As these guys get closer and closer, as these guys get closer and closer, the margin obviously starts getting closer and closer, and we have we are getting much less satisfied about the answers and much less, less reliable. And then when I get the, the typical situation when this happens, what do we do next? By the way, if this math actually showed up, this is maximize this, minimize that, okay, over these parameters, wi, beta i. Maximum min, just take the negative, that's the term, I'm fine. Okay, subject to this constraint that these are equal to one, subject to those are equal to one, this is a Lagrange multiplier problem. Okay, same thing, it's constrained optimization. Okay, so what can we do to make this better? 
of the simple criterion. It's really simple, by the way. All these things are really simple if you know the answer. If you don't want to look at or shit, you know, really simple. <laughs> but actually, you can actually come up with your own loss function. How do you fix this? I'm still, I'm still going to insist there's a line. Okay, one line. I did say you could get quantumatic in there. That's a line, by the way, just with x squared. It doesn't seem like a line, but you're to, to, to a statistician with the line. But it's average. <laughs> okay, we'll get there in a second. Okay. How do I fix this? <clears throat> Stick out? Oh, that we can do, we'll deal with that. Let's not quite go there yet. Okay. Well, okay, the one thing we're gonna actually do here is I'm gonna add I'm gonna add in an extra little thing. I find again I'm I'm being pretty loose with the truth here. <laughs> okay, but I, I think it actually helps. Okay. This is what we're gonna do. Okay, we're gonna add in an extra constraint. Okay, and again, I like it. So this is exactly the same thing. That's why it formats exactly the same way. <laughs> okay, so maximize the margin. So that's our goal. Put in this constraint so it's still distance from the observation to the line, so we can interpret it easily. Then this is the distance from the from the observation to the line. And this says this says make it positive if it's on the wrong side, if it's on the negative side, so that we're only so they're never going to cancel each other out. Okay, we might even say this. we can take the absolute value. That will be fine too. Okay. Uh, this really doesn't matter. The y is not important. But they, this is just basically saying add up all the arrows. And then this bit here, if I take the arrow out of the way, <laughs> okay, is this epsilon? Just I'm going to give you n. For each observation, I'm going to give you a blank check. And you can add them all up, and you have to be below, you have to spend less than c. Okay, you don't have to spend C, you don't get to keep the money though. <laughs> okay. Okay, you have to you have to you have to spend less than C. And I'm gonna do it in this way. You change this one little thing. You don't have to be positive. You can be on the wrong side of the line. In fact, you can be you can be there's my line. This is gonna be the best bit of line. Okay, at the end, this is my best bit of line. There's my margin. Maximize the margin as best as you can, but I'm going to let you actually put. Uh, I'm going to let you put this guy on the wrong side of the line. This is in the old version. This was this had to be positive. Yes. So if it was up, if it was it was minus one here. It had to be on the right side on the below the line. Now I'm saying you can be on the wrong side of the line, and in fact, I am going to even let you. Be on the wrong side of the margin. Okay, you can be over here for all I care. But if you, if I'm going to tolerate this guy being over here, everyone else pays a price because I take it out of my budget here. But that guy to be all the way over here, which is the distance from here to here, which is okay, one minus epsilon because this, this value here is now going to be way off. So epsilon has to be very negative. Okay, so not very positive, should I say? Okay, very positive. So we can, it's, it's going to have to be bigger than one to get beyond this margin here. And now it's going to be twice as big as the margin, three times. I'm going to pay, I'm going to be chewing up my entire budget for that one guy. Does this make sense? And just doing mean, this again, the math, right? You write down the math, and you can, the Grange multipliers, and Colin's the only one who actually said this. Yes, I know how to solve that. <laughs> okay, but you know, the rest of us are going like, okay, uh, 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 gotta remember my math. Wait, wait. Heuristically, it actually makes perfect sense. It's a loss function. So we just basically budget. Now, if nobody actually goes across the margin, if they're all zero, then this, we're back to the same problem. They're totally separable classes. Okay, if some of them go across the margin, then we actually we, we, we pay a little bit, but not everybody. The bigger, the bigger one of these epsilons is, the rest, the, the rest have to be accordingly smaller. So life is good. Everyone happy? And this is support vector classifiers. Where's the machine coming? Okay, so, this, so everyone happy? This is another classification mechanism. It uses a totally different loss function. The loss function for this guy was minimum prediction error. Minimum prediction error, minimum misclassification error. Here we're doing maxim maximizing the margin. There's no reason we should get the same answer. We do in many cases, but we have totally. The nice thing about this is, which one should I use? You're spoiled for choice. 
<laughs> okay. And as I said before, and you know, if you use them all, they give you qualitatively the same predictions, you should be very happy. It doesn't cost you an awful lot because the computer does it all for you. All you've got to do is figure out which function to call. If they give you different answers, they're probably telling you something about the signal, okay? And that the structure you're missing using one or two of the methods, or else your data are so precariously poised that you are, you're basically cheating. You're, you're knowingly sort of misleading. Oh, so you might have covered this last time, but it would also be just the nature of the problem you're working with and the type of data that a support maker machine approach may be better for, I don't know, looking at license plates and that for some other problem, some other approach may be better. Because of the loss option, in my, in my mind. Because you're actually well, some loss functions may work better for some particular types of data than for other. Types of data, or, or is it more that in some settings you want to use this particular loss function, and in other settings you might want to use some other loss function? Oh, I, think, I think ultimately you're right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying. Yeah, to, to, which is, which is well, you know, if the same methods, but they're not the same methods, but they've got different loss functions, and inherent in that they've got slightly different loss functions. I just, I just, I just, uh, I just erased. This uh, the last function here between um, what, what we're talking about the contingency last function when we have the soft threshold and then the uh, you know, what, what, what I was talking about there. Um, you know they're slightly different. Okay, but if, if they're if they're qualitatively the same procedure, they should give you qualitatively the same answer. But, but one may be better than the other. Okay, but uh, but yes, if you choose your last, if you're going to choose generic last function that you go from the internet, you say, uh, and you're not, you, and you don't know that one is better. Uh, I know you can't retroactively explain why one is better. Then so I think there's a slight problem if you're just randomly sort of just picking methods off the shelf. That's all I get. But there are, but picking the right loss function is absolutely critical. It changes the entire problem. And if you know the loss function that, that is appropriate for your problem, you're not. I mean, then, you know, if you actually really know that for good reasons, that's the real trick, and that because you're now actually. Answering the right question. I think to a large extent we end up answering generic questions and using very generic methods. But it sense to me. I mean, so you know, but it is true. It's definitely certain problems deserve certain loss functions and they they will be better. I but a priori, if you don't know, you're kind of going, okay, that one seems to be good. Uh, but I'll go with that. So, yeah. so do you mean that you use multiple methods and they give you quantitative? Similar result. What do you report? The qualitative answer. Because <laughs> we're trying to do science, or whatever it is that we're trying to actually do, is we're actually trying to meet. I mean, I, I suspect that there's another issue, which is you know, if, you're, well, if, if you work in industry, what you do, you don't report everything, you just implement it in a system that actually utilizes this. If you're in science, you actually have to justify this stuff. You know, to some extent, you, you do say there is no discernible difference. Between these methods, it's not like I am cheating here by actually choosing reporting the method that gives me the answer that I wanted ahead of time. Okay, that's, what, that's essentially what you're trying to do in my mind. You're trying to, you're trying to allay fears about the, re the reproducibility of this and the sort of the, the objectivity. So if you can sort of say these all gave me the same answers and I wasn't tweaking uh, these the results, that seems reasonable. I don't know. I mean, this is the other case where. In a paper that you've actually printed, I don't know that you want to put in every whole copious, you know, the 1,200 pages of of uh, results that you get. But I think you do want to basically say that you tried this. And you see this in many, in many papers, I believe, like you said, not knowing each discipline that you're all in, <laughs> which is they say, say, and we also did this, this, and this, and they all came to the same results. Then you hopefully then report the actual, you actually provide the code and the data so people can actually verify that you didn't mess it up. That you, I mean, this is fun. There's what these YIs, and, and I had a colleague who decided that death, death was one and uh, living was zero, and everyone else thought it was the other way around, and the software encoded it that way. So he was, people were getting a lot of very odd predictions, and they're like, oh, that's what it is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> convention and being able to understand what the code actually does is important. But yeah, but I mean, I think just giving the quality of answers. But I mean, I think what we're really trying to get at is, you know, if you're using generic things, people, you should be using the right loss function if you know it. If, if you know it. Putting costs in is great. If you're using generic stuff, what we're worried about is people actually cheating. 
by actually you know, p-hacking or whatever it is, or basically just doing some wacky stuff, that, and that's all we're trying to get to, to avoid calm. Yeah, so following up on this, you might, you've got no gambles, and we've got a few pieces focus on mean estimation of mean estimation. Okay. And we should all just go, right, we're all going to do the maximum life work. Right? But in these prediction settings, right, where you're trying to make money, right, then you can have very unusual loss functions, right? So in this that misclassification, maybe, you know, it doesn't matter, but false positives, false negatives, right? There may be different trade offs on those. So there you would have hugely different loss functions. And, and do people do this in practice? In, Industry, or, or are they still using the off the shelf? We'll just go with you know, scoring a one for if we got it right and zero. I don't know because as you uh, as you and I can say, we don't work in industry. <laughs> uh, the uh, I mean, the answer is I've seen people do really you know, totally off the shelf, couldn't care less what the loss function is. I've literally watched people burn money because they have to burn money to their clients, even though they know the classification model is complete nonsense. Watch them do this. You know, and it's part of their business model for a while they're starting up there. They're doing something rather than actually trying to maximize um, accuracy, <laughs> revenue even. Uh, you, but they're maximizing revenue overall, <laughs> you know, two years out because that's still business. <laughs> it's a whole different loss function, a whole different mindset. I, I, I think I think the answer is yeah, but a really interesting question for people care. So not just making money, but actually saving, uh, you know, when they're actually doing things and they're you know, the self-driving cars, the satellites, where they basically put in, they put in loss functions, where they say the cost of this is just outrageously high. So we will never get that, uh, that, that thing, but they have to balance this off. And this, but the real standard, I think, for, for most statisticians, machine learning people, we don't know what those loss functions are. They are domain specific or, um, so, you know, customer specific, if you will. So, to, the, but the right thing to do is to elicit them, is to actually sit down and say, what do you really care about? And let's think about what you should be minimizing. Now we can do it. And in many cases, as I mentioned, I think you know, most of these things can actually be done by putting costs in. You know, and it's not even cost dollar amounts, it's ratios. I mean, nearly all of these things turn out to be ratios. So, you can actually solve them in closed form, and yet people don't. But I, I know that. Whenever I said say that, well, a priori we don't know, you know. But this is I mentioned it, it's mentioned. This goes back to what we were talking about a little bit last week as well, which is what the heck is that PD point oh five? Did you, who made peace with that? Uh, you know, and you didn't. You just go along with the with the game, uh, you know. But this is there's a loss in there for your career that you're that you're, you're signing on to, and likewise for loss functions, you're 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 deciding what you actually care about, and most of us we don't because we don't understand, it, and it's hard. But this loss function is not that complicated, is it? To actually write it out, you're saying there's a budget to be given out to each guy. Hopefully, nobody will use any money, okay? But I'll let I'll 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 give it a bit. You, some of you can be really far off, and some of you will have to be really close as a result, or else I just can't solve this problem. Or I'll increase the budget, okay? Increasing the budget. How do I pick this C? There's an extra parameter here that I kind of never mentioned. So, in, and again, as Colin's pointing out, if this is a real budget, <laughs> then it's kind of like, hang on a second, you cannot spend that much. <laughs> okay, sorry, no, you're, not, you're not allowed. It may not, be, it may not be money, but it may be something else. But suppose we get to actually decide this. How do we just, how, suppose we get to pick an arbitrary value between zero and 100. What do I use? <laughs> That one way is cross validation, is to actually go and actually minimize the minimize the overall error, isn't it? The misclassification error. But and we do it for every value of C. This is a heck of a big computation to do. But it doesn't matter. Computational time is cheap, relatively speaking. Okay, your phone can do this for you. <laughs> okay, you know, uh, especially in especially in the in the world that many of you are in, where you don't have a lot, a lot of observations. You know, when you have 10,000 million observations, yeah, think about it, <laughs> okay? But, but we, we can go through cross-validation, find the best value of C, just like we did for K-nearest neighbors, just like we did for anything. You can't do that, by the way, using maximum likelihood. There is no maximum likelihood for C. Okay, it doesn't have a distribution. You might be able to do it through some Bayesian approach, and, okay? But then you're gonna have to start assuming a lot of parametric forms and all that sort of stuff. Cross-validation gets you out of 
problems when you when you when we just need to go and do essentially a grid search and minimize. What are we minimizing? We're maximizing M, but actually what we're trying to do is when in cross-validation, we're actually trying to find the best prediction error. That's class MSE, classification, mis uh, misclassification rate for each value of C. And, with, and within that, we actually get the best one, the one that maximizes the margin. Make sense? Everyone happy? But these are really, I mean, you know, what Colin's getting at is really important is, is pick the right loss function. It actually really right, is, is appropriate. Now, that you can't report. You go, like, here's our loss function. <laughs> and you go, well, we don't agree. <laughs> and, and science doesn't work that way, but it should. Which is like uh, some interesting papers that said we're using the loss function that is not appropriate. Here's a better loss function. But it is fine. Okay, so this is support vector machines. No, it's not. <laughs> support vector classification. Where's the machine? Here? And why on earth do they call it support vector machines as opposed to? But this again is a concept of maximum margin. Whether separable, great. Not separable, we have to actually put in this penalty of allowed a few people to be wrong. We actually give them opportunities to be really wrong. We do this kind of thing. By the way, this is not that easy to solve mathematically. It doesn't have a nice closed form solution, but it does have an absolutely beautiful characteristic. And that's what makes them machines. It turns out, well, because of this magical constraint here, this number two in here, what we just threw in, and compute the distance between these things. All we care about is the distance between the observations in X. We don't care about the actual, the actual value of X1 to Xt for any observation. We care about how far it is away from all of the other observations. Okay? So what we do is we can actually compute the distances. Now we do this all the time. That's whole of statistics is based on distance. And over is just analysis of errors is just the distance between the Progression is the distance between the line and the other. Similarity, distance, same thing, great. But this is really special. The math here for support vector machines turns out that it doesn't even matter. All, all we're going to do is look at the distances. And the distances is, we call these the inner products, okay? It's looking at the inner product of, the, of these two vectors, uh, two observations. And we can generalize that to be arbitrary kernels, or hexakernels. Okay. Have you heard of kernel estimation, kernel density estimation? Okay. So it's some sort of measure of distance, so it's fine. But you can put in arbitrary things. So if you actually, so that the, the, the math comes out here that all we're looking at is these pairwise distance maps. <laughs> um, we, we can put in between all pairs, xi and xj, these are the observations. We just compute the inner product of these other. But actually, it's just any measure of distance. And we can come up with crazy measures of distance. And then that was the that was the picture I was. That was the picture I was drawing. And I have one on my screen and I can I can do it. And I ask you another question here. What if we do this? Let's keep the colors the same. Okay, we got all these guys here, there's a blue one. There's a consistency. Are we changing the color notation? How do we do this guy? There is no line. There's simply no line. I did mention this last week. So there's no prizes for guessing the question. You boost up the middle. Don't, and don't use the word boost. <laughs> it just gets confusing. You arbitrarily raise the middle on the other end. So, we, so if, if we pull this up or we push it down, pull the other guys up, we can introduce another variable, okay? We basically can draw a line. So imagine that the red bits just come out towards you, and then I can just draw a, a, a plane right down between, no problem, okay? Or we, can, or we can use a different measure of distance, which is essentially a radial distance, okay? And again, so we can actually put in this thing called a radial basis, okay, which are used quite commonly. And we're going to measure the distance. And again, a lot of times we're going to measure the distance between the support vector on the edge, the nearest one to the next, to the other class. So which makes the computation even easier. And we're just going to, you know, we can actually think about xi minus uh, the, the norm of this guy, and we'll take the exponential of this. And we want things to be very close, and we can put in a basis like this. Alternatively, we could just say it's x1 plus x2 plus 
uh, because uh, what we just going to do is uh, we'll just do x1 times x2 in this particular case. We'll actually raise things up. Okay, so we can actually start putting in polynomial expressions here rather than just the answers. We just like progression to just putting in x1 squared, x2 squared, x3 squared, and so forth. We can start putting in kernels, which is basically basically ways of computing distances to introduce, essentially introduce new variables. But, but it's not, and we're not actually introducing new variables. Why? Because we're only computing in a problem, so it's much faster. It's way cleaner and faster, and it also gets us into some exotic shapes that we can actually do. Okay, but basically, uh, we can do this. People use this example all the time. Why is it the most stupid example in the world? In my opinion, not quite the most stupid example, but darn close to it. What's the right way to analyze this data? X1, X2. They're, we're, they're saying to us, bring up, go to three dimensions. X1, X2, and find the third dimension to pull this out. Whereas I can solve this in one dimension. I was laughing at this example. <laughs> it's because they, I know how they craft it. Hmm? The range of x1? No, because that, that, that's because that means I, I could, but you could try, but they've got the guys here in the middle of x1, so that's not going to do it. I need something. Recenter and then draw a line uh, at R. At R. Radius, whatever. Ah, radius. They're polar coordinates. <laughs> There's only one variable here. <laughs> and they, the, the, it's funny, they've been this example all the time. The way we generate the data set is by polar coordinates and we're throwing some noise. And it's just R. It's just basically the distance from the center will separate this thing. And that's what we're actually getting at when we actually pull out the third dimension. We're just pulling this guy out. So uh, based on how far it is away from the, from the center. Okay, but hey, all I do is just compute, the co compute these in terms of polar coordinates. Okay, and I get an end of this cluster, and all of a sudden, when we cluster, you basically sort of see, okay, this sort of thing. These are your blue guys, these are your red guys. Here, I've actually drawn it because that was the way I drew it last night, was um, there's fewer here than there are here, okay, which means you actually get a smaller amount, but you actually still see these. You see a cluster in one place. So one dimension gets it right. If you know the right dimension, <laughs> that's the variable selection. Everyone happy? And support vector machines. There's a little orange multiplier in my examples here. We were allocating a budget for getting things wrong. Okay, and this is kind of a, a good thing to do. And um, there are somewhere in my notes from last week, and it take me longer to find. Uh, so let me just, again, if you're unhappy with the me drawing on the board, I apologize. It's one of those weeks when it's the week of nasty. Last me to do something in this. Uh, how do we, for misclassification, I'm going to jump soon uh, to, so misclassification, okay? We're interested in misclassification, okay? So basically, there's different things. In binary case, what do we have? Okay, so you can draw it any way you want. Truth, truth, uh, prediction, truth, other way around. I don't know which one, which way is straight, straight anymore. So we just have to keep, keep it. Keep it right, okay? So let's make this the truth. This is your prediction, okay? So this is either, you know, this is plus one, this is minus one, this is plus one, this is minus one, okay? Let's call them the same. Now, there's really only four outcomes here. I, I, I was, I truly was a one, and I predicted one, we win, okay? Here, I truly was a minus one, I, I got minus one, I won. These guys, these off-diagonal terms of this matrix are how we actually diagnose things. In the, um, in the support vector machine that I actually just drew, you could be concerned about the magnitude, about how far into the other guy you are. All we were concerned about that was actually um, <coughs> labeling it blue or red. So it was just either, are you plus one, or are you blue, or are you red? But we weren't concerned about the magnitude of the error. That's another feature of the loss function that you may be concerned about. And that's fine. There's no reason why, when we are actually talking about anything we want here, now this is binary classification. Binary classification is so much easier to talk about for various different reasons. But there's no reason for, the, for, this, for this confusion matrix. 
This one I love for taking chart for bias. It's not a confusion matrix. It's just exactly what it is. <laughs> okay. And, okay. And, and we will notice that there's no reason that these numbers have to be the same. So we can be confused in different ways. They, 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 okay. They, they, they don't have to be symmetric. And then when we get over to here, what we're now trying to actually predict various different um, categories. Okay. So now this is multi class. So you're in, you're in A, B, C, D, E. Okay, so I'm trying to predict your major or whatever it is. I'm trying to predict different characteristics. Of it. And you're in one of many different kind of possible outcomes. I do exactly the same thing. Okay? And I just look at these. And as I've been telling my students in my capstone class in this the last couple of weeks, is this is where the fun starts. You, you get this. It, oftentimes we're just interested in the, we're just in, interested in the, the the misclassification rate, okay? The overall misclassification rate. Just tell me how many weren't on the diagonal. But that's, that's a gross simplification. We're much more interested in, let's look and see where they weren't. And again, I don't care about that A, A. I don't care if I'm getting that wrong. I really care if I'm getting this wrong. This is, you know, how much, you know, will they be full on a loan of the 10,000, 100,000, and so forth. I'm really, really interested in this guy, but they're gonna be full on loans that are, okay? Uh, there are many, many trillions of dollars. These are the guys who have different loss functions, but certainly if I don't have a different loss function, I want to see what's going on here. And then when I'm missing features in my model, they should show up in here. These are the residuals that we are familiar with in regression. <clears throat> so this is very simple. That's your confusion matrix. This is your summary for misclassification. And sometimes we'll start collapsing these down because they're not that exciting. We sort of, uh, in the residuals, but they're still there. Life is good. Anything else about this uh, about confusion matrices? They're very simple. But I'll say that this is where you start looking and say, what's up with those guys? Why did these guys, why did I have 25 here and in the corresponding thing, I only had two? So, you know, this is what the canonic, one of the canonical examples about classification, as you see, is this thing called the M list. Data, which are these handwritten, uh, handwritten digits, zero to nine on, uh, on the US Postal Office, uh, mm -hmm. where people actually. So you, so you see this sort of thing where we basically say, this is an eight and this is a three, okay? And these two are easily mistaken, okay? So you'll see a big, whereas you'd see, can, can I confuse an eight and a one? It's really hard to confuse an eight, but you can see my right now, can't see the right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Whereas a one and a seven, those two are easily confused, okay? So you can sort of see patterns as to what's actually going on. You can go back and actually take a look at the X's that were used. They, let's look at the distribution. Ah, they see, they have, they have different covariant structures for those guys, so there's something going on. So it can actually lead you back to, to different things uh, to actually, to, to, to do the sweeping essentially on the residual analysis. And what happened? Yes. Question: Do you support vectors on the general binary? Um, what do you think? Why? Well, the answer is no. Because you can do support vector regression. Okay. You can do support vector regression, and so so we can handle continuous variables of what you're doing. And that's I have a little note in here, and that's because that's really fun. Okay. Okay. Just, I'm just going to go here for one second. Okay. What are we doing there in support vector regression? You're trying to predict why. A continuous variable, not a label, blue or red, but actually, you're actually trying to predict why. And you've got the, you may, you're going to try to find this maximum, maximum marginal, uh, marginal classifier, essentially a predictor at this point. You're trying to find this line. So again, it's a beta 0 plus a beta 1 up to beta xp, the beta x1 here. Okay, so it's y minus this is the loss function. It looks like this, it looks like these squares. How is it different from these squares? It's related to there. How do you change that loss function to something that isn't these squares, that is still doing prediction error? Okay, so this is just your x beta, your linear model. You take the sum of the squares here. That, you minimize subject to this, and you can, you can put a constraint on them, beta is normal, uh, not that the norm is one, you want, you can put in these constraints. But you're not capturing the essence of what's going on here, 
Okay, a little bit of trickery goes on here, a little, again, not trickery, just a, just a, a different decision for your box function says, I'm only considering these guys, which are bigger than some threshold. If they're bigger than that. Okay, I'm looking for the N, which says that I'm only going to count the ones which are outside of this or inside of it, okay? And I will say that. So we just change, so basically you have all these residuals from i is equal to one up to n, and you only look at the ones which are big. And the rest of them count nothing. Okay? And that's a totally different loss function from the squares. Totally different loss function. And it gives you a totally different answer. But it's useful. It's another loss function. But you didn't think of that loss function, okay? Because we but now we do. Okay, but that's not okay. That's that's how you connect this in terms of your regression. Is you basically sense your loss that you don't care about. Okay, but how do you deal with support vector machines or classification when you have two, uh, three or more classes? With k nearest neighbors, it's easy, isn't it? You basically we have three classes. Okay, all these guys over here. We got. These guys over here, and I'm going to be so happy with myself. I got multiple girls today. Okay. okay, so you can have whoever you're closest to, you just basically say you're the winner. Okay, and we ended up with a nice little sort of curve, you know, with the boundaries that look like this. And if you're okay, and with QDA, we ended up with the same thing as well. With LDA and QDA, we ended up with linear boundaries and quadratic boundaries that could divide between these guys. Because in these guys, we were looking at likelihood ratios. And you basically said, take the ratio of group one, uh, well, group two to group one, group three to group one, and so forth, and you just take the max. Okay? And you just take the one that is most likely to be a more point. The more the points, you remember the picture I drew you know, in simple, in one dimension, you know, you've got these different guys here, and you basically say, that's the point. Well, that's the one you're closest to. So you, took, you literally just picked the, 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 the biggest ratio, the one that is most likely to end. How do we do that with the classification value? If we set it up to be yi is equal to plus or minus one, and then we look at the, whether you're on the wrong side, whether you're on the left or the, or the right, the top or the bottom of the line, so how do we do it this way? A tree. It doesn't generalize. It doesn't work. So one way that one way that people do it is, but you know that that's just probably easy to think. One way that people do it is to actually say, well, I'm going to predict. So we've got three labels, A, B, and C. I'm going to basically say, are you an A or are you a B or a C? And if you're a B or a C, then I'm going to ask you, are you a B or a C? So it's kind of like a classification, it's a sequential test. So this is a you know, one against all of them. Okay, or else you can do all pairs and stuff like that. That's kind of a it's not it's it's not a satisfactory solution to some extent it's a, because you may not you, because there you we haven't hey we haven't, been, we haven't spoken about bias variance for a long time so we haven't actually said how stable are these things and, and all this here we're just going ahead and saying we're getting the right answer we have enough observations here that where that our estimates are good but remember everything going on here is we could overfit we've got x's in here if they ever show up how many x's should i put in <laughs> That's an age-old question, okay? Uh, okay, so we're, 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 we're there now, okay? Believe it or not, that's exactly where we're going next. <laughs> Even surprising. <laughs> okay, but, okay, but you, you do have this problem with bias variance and all that, uh, in all of these different things that we talked about a lot the last time. One last thing before we go from here, which just, if you're not familiar with confusion matrices, sometimes half of you weren't, I suspect you're not familiar with the Aussie named borrow C curves. Okay, the C were operating characteristic curves dating back to apparently <laughs> Pearl Harbor. Okay, uh, and, and how people actually recognize radar and stuff like that. But they're, we use them horribly misnamed. Okay, and, and so they're, they're very simple and very useful. And that is the following. And this is just a very quick idea. We've got a score here, yi times this thing here. We've got a score, it's big. Okay, the further you are away from the line, the bigger it is. If it's positive, it's good. If it's negative, it's bad. You've got a score, and then, okay, the bigger the score, okay, the more blue you are. 
okay, uh, but the more red you are, you go, we know, we know which direction you're in the label lines. Okay? This type one, type two errors, I can, I can control. Basically, okay, so let's figure out this way. I basically say, here's, in this, we'll just take this simple idea, okay? Uh, we, we measure, we measure, uh, some help. Um, what I can basically do, let's, let's take an even central one. Are you a red or a blue? Here's an answer, you're a blue. I don't care. You me I measure all these things, I just run up to XP, and I throw them away, and I say you're blue. Okay, some of them will be red. This, okay. So let's do this here. This is the percent of false positives. And over here, let's put in the percent of true positives. Okay, we want to be high here. Okay, we want to be low here. Yes, generally speaking. <laughs> okay. If I basically say, okay, and this is a small, this isn't, this is the case. So basically, I, if I've got, I've got, I've got a few positives uh, uh, that, uh, that are in here, and I say that they're, they're all positives. Okay, and the percent of them all is positive. Which way am I going? So basically, if I have a really bad rule, and I basically say everyone, everyone's positive, I will maximize the false positive. Yes. Just tell me if I'm on the right direction. I start in different places. And then. Okay. So I'll be up here because I will definitely have all the true positives. If you're positive, I want you because I just say everyone's positive. Okay, okay, we're sort of saying, are you red or blue? Okay, are you sick or not sick? Yes, you're sick. You're sick. That's positive. Okay, I will be up here. This is sort of, okay, that's fine. I got everybody, but I was really bad. And as I dial this back and instead of saying, now I start taking in the X1 to XP into account, I have these scores. I think score. I have the threshold of this score. Below, above this, I say you're positive. As I make that, as I bring this threshold up, I gradually get fewer and fewer positives. So now you have to be infinite. Your score has to be infinite. Okay, it means nobody's positive. So I'm going to get, I'll have zero false positives, yes? Because no one's positive, but I've had a whole load of lists. So I'll be down here, okay? And that's it, okay? And if I'm guessing, that's what happens. As I move this threshold down, I'm guessing, okay? I'm, no, I'm doing no better than half and half, okay? Prorated for the score. What we want to see is this. As I move the threshold, and I can do this, just like we did with K near stables, I do this for every K, I can do this for every threshold. Every value of my threshold, I will get okay. So I, I, I've got a score. I measure a score, S of X, score of X, and I'd say, is it above some threshold tau? Okay, some, something, two. I, I plug in two and I count the number. I look at my confusion matrix for tau being two, and I count the misclassifications. Okay, and I say the rate, I sort of say, I count the misclassifications. So this was false positive. So we said it was false, but it was positive. But we, the truth was it was a negative. Okay, so this was so this is a false positive. Okay, so we count the proportion in here. Okay, and we, we put it up here and then, and then on, on here and then we count the true positives from the same confusion matrix and I get a point here. Now I change my threshold to be different and I recompute all of this. It does, turns out not to be very complicated. So we test and I get another point here. Okay, and I get another point here. So I do this for a single model, but for different thresholds, just different decisions. And I end up with a nice curve that looks like this. And it will have to go down to here because it's when I basically say that everyone's positive. Okay, so they are okay, negative. So say, okay. Now, the beauty of these ROC curves is the following you come along and so say, but don't you? I have a support vector machine for this very purpose, and I use some exotic radial basis functions for my machine. And somebody else comes along and says, well, but I've got my boost, I've got my, my ensemble of, of brand new forests. And we draw our curves for these different things. As soon as I can. Okay. Who wins? Everyone. Mm. Everyone. Everyone? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's got to be a winner. <laughs> Who's got to be winning that <laughs> So in this case, we want the curve to be as, as, as close to the top as possible up here. We, want, we basically wanted to say, if we, if we have a deviation anyone as possible, we get everybody and we get no false positives. It just goes 
perfectly upwards. It's 100% here as quickly as possible. And, and then just and obviously save there. Are we just going to bullet pitting? Why is there a trail? Yes. How are we going to fit? Implicit in all of this, if I have cross validated or my model selected to avoid overfitting, you will all just you can just you know just go after your model with n observations, with you put in n predictors and fit it perfectly. Like you're done, okay? And useless, <laughs> utterly useless. You're just fitting the data that you have. Like just you know, uh, just saying just you know, I can predict the past really really well. I just look it up and tell people that. Okay, so we do. We want so the inherent in all this, like I said, we we drop the bias variance trade off for now. <laughs> okay, I'll get back. <laughs> uh, but um, but we're assuming that these are actually meaningful. So once that once they become meaningful, remember also by the way, these are estimates. Okay, we put a hat on these to make them estimates. These are estimated ROC curves. So if this thing, if I did this again in cross validation, and I actually ended up with this as for a different uh, uh, fold in my cross population, and the next one turned out to be over here, and I'm picking this one, I'm clearly, you know, I'm clearly cheating. <laughs> I'm choosing that. I'm going to average them all together. Okay, so the cross validation will give me this is a measure essentially of my test NSC, like mean squared error of the application rate. I'm going to use cross validation to make that robust a little bit to actually do it, not on the training set, but on the test set. We do work with cross validation. So just to map the ROC curve onto the confusion matrix with a false, false positive value represents um, of all of the observations that are actually not true, the percentage that you said were positive. So it's like looking at the right hand side of Does everyone get that? Everyone agree? I never know. I can never remember. I have to sit down and really think it hard because people keep transposing these things on me. <laughs> so I always have to like, and this is where it really helps. But yes, it's the false positives. So we're interested in the people. So that it's false positives. So we're saying they're positives, but they're not. So we are looking at the truth being negative in this case. Right. We're looking at this and the proportion of them right. that was in yes. this box out of this column. Yes. And then conversely, yeah. the true positives would be of all of the people who are truly positive the proportion you say are positive yes so they're looking at two separate columns um actually no we can i have to think let me think about this because it's always confusing because i'm saying keep transposing this you're typically typically we tend to be looking across different rows and columns so I have, let me think about it but it is really important to get it right okay and remember just the, i think the critical thing so it's it's easy enough to get right once you define terms and then the, the critical thing is this is for one threshold. We make a threshold, we find out who's wrong, who we classify right and wrong, who ends up in these four boxes. Then we end up with one observation for that threshold. And then we move the threshold and do it again. And that's why. And so this curve are points corresponding to many, 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 many uh, confusion matrices. There for each threshold as we go on, based on the misclassification rate based on that rule. Okay, so that's how we get this, this curve. So it's kind of weird. We get a curve based on different thresholds that are indexed here. What happened? So with the with the curve look different if we decide to say, um, well, in signal detection terms, if you want to avoid misses versus if you want to. Um, <clears throat> that's what we're trading off here. As we change the threshold, we're actually favoring okay. those positive. Oh, okay, that was my first Okay, or that, that, that's what this is measuring. It says, it says, so this is where, going back to what columns they're saying, is people come around and say, I'm happy with this. I don't mind making that many errors because I'm making that many positive things. I get to choose. So this is, this is, this is literally sort of a, um, you pick a point that you're comfortable with, okay? And people will do that based on what they're actually comfortable with, unless it's, if this is all baked into your loss function, where you actually have this and you understand that you're optimizing exactly what you want, then life is good. But otherwise, you actually have to see what the optimal ought to be. And this is an appropriate thing. This is the operating characteristic of your classifier. You get to choose where a lot fair one is going to be you need to actually not as, avoid making a lot of mistakes. 
okay, and the mistakes are different. False positives, false negatives are totally different. And these are what we actually care about. Okay? Everyone happy? Anyone happy? <laughs> I'm happy. It's almost happy. <laughs> okay. Uh, regression. Okay. Everyone happy with regression? Anyone not? Regression is just regression. Okay. Everyone sees regression. Apparently, they even do it nicely. <laughs> okay. Okay. It gets more complicated. There is a thing. Regression is wonderful. It's just it's it's the bread and butter of statistics because we can fit anything with an approximately linear, okay? And what we mean by linear is that it's additive and it's linear, okay? But basically, we will write this down. The reason why uh, it's, it's, it's so elementary for us, and, and hopefully for you guys too, you're going to hang on a second. When I write down, as I did, y is equal to beta zero plus beta one x one plus beta two x two x one squared, you say that's not linear. We say, yes, it is. It's linear in betas. And you go like this, yeah, not linear in the x, and you go, we don't care. We have no interest in that. It's linear in the betas, because that's what we're solving for. Because we flip the problem around to look for the betas, not the x's. Okay, so when you do calculus, we're doing it on the betas, not the x's. So we don't care. So you just put an extra column. It's obvious. It's basically, it's obvious. But once you know that, then you can think, oh, well, hang on a second. The sky's the limit. We can start putting in x squared, x cubed, sine of x, the sine of x cubed divided by the log of x over 2. Okay, and off we start throwing all this sort of stuff in. Everyone happy with that? <laughs> and then we get to over there. Now you know all your people. Now we really are in that situation. So all the statistics in the, in the, early, in the early days was done for a nice small n. Few p, a few x's, small p, and then all of a sudden, like 20 years ago, we started measuring massive amounts of p. <laughs> okay, a huge number of x's, and now the, the, the game is slightly different, okay, and leads to all sorts of interesting conceptual challenges. Okay, but these are, this is an extremely flexible model. So even so when, we, when we're looking at the, 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 the original picture I drew, we'll that quite graphic. We had to fit a linear model to it, a straight line. We can easily fit the quadratic, we just put in an x squared term. Uh, okay, and life is fine. We have bias that we can control with this. We have flexibility in this. And as we probably what you got from the bias variance trade off is the more flexibility we add, the greater the chance we're overfitting, the greater the chance we are minimizing the bias at the expense of increasing the variance. Okay, because we're chasing over. The, how do you know? You adapt. Okay, except for unless you cross that way. Or how do you do model selection? We've all done regression, we've all done model selection, I hope. Or somehow God told you what the model was and how you didn't even ask. You just assume I use all of the X's and I won't touch any of them, I won't square them, I'll just I'll only immediately, but you're, because you're allowed to square them, because you're allowed to take the sine of X, because you're allowed to take the log of Y, oh God, you didn't change them response <laughs> okay so how do you do model selection how do you know what X is to put in because as we wrote down on the board the more X's you put in when they stop accounting for any change in Y you're adding variance to the, that sum the variance of Y is just the sum of the variances so you're adding noise yeah Stepwise criteria using, okay, using AIC or BIC, okay? Everyone familiar with AIC? Anyone familiar with AIC? <laughs> People are waving at me. <laughs> Hi, how are you? <laughs> BIC, these are data. Um, Mallow's CP, and they're all, if I, did I write them down here? I know I did, actually. There we go. These are different criteria that you can use. Mallow's CP, columns, they, they all have the same, basic characteristic, and this is actually, it's actually nice. There's a nice progression in statistics as we gradually figure things out. This is residual sum of squares, okay? Plus, there's a penalty based on how many variables you have in your model. The bigger the number of p's, the worse it gets. And it really kind of goes up with sigma, which is the, the irreducible error, just the variability of an arbitrary. Why do we scale by that? You gotta actually do a little bit of math and figure out why that makes sense. It doesn't not make sense, but it's sort of it's but it's the inherent irreducible variability. Why it's linear that it's every variable gets exactly the same penalty cost essentially. If you add one more, it goes up by that amount, but that's fine. 
smaller, the bigger the game, the smaller this gets. So it's, you know, we, we believe more data. Okay, if you have twice as much data, we, we have we believe you more. Okay, the AIC uh, is is just um, slight variation of this. It's just how you control different assumptions, different math gets you gets you there. BIC, these two only differ based on the two and the log n. Okay, so this this actually increases the penalty on the number of observable variables that you put in your model relative to this. Okay. These are all based on, and this is the bit that bothers me, and I don't know if it bothers Colin, <laughs> but uh, uh, these are based on likelihoods. And I don't, tip, I remember the parametric, non parametric we talked about, and the idea that I want a little bit of robustness, that I don't have to rely on pretending I know the, like the form of the likelihood. Um, so there's a whole approximation, and the likelihood turns out to be very stable. Central limit theorem kicks in, like good things happen. So I'm not, I, I probably don't care so much. I start caring when I get into high dimensions. That's when life falls apart for everybody. And that's the problem we actually have here. We're chasing the dimensions. So if, if P is large and I'm running round after dimensions, I start losing faith in my likelihood, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm, I'm doing bad. I'm doing bad. And we just, the bigger the dimensions, I, don't, I think I mentioned it last week, cursive dimensionality. I was talking a lot last week, but not to you guys, but to other people too. <laughs> uh, the, uh, so if, you have a, if, if we have one variable, and I got, ten, and I got 100 observations, and they're, let's say they're uniform 0 to 1. This is, this is elementary, but just, just in case it's not. Nobody's ever explained it. I found some things just to be very useful, but somebody explained it. I know that's obvious. So thank you, but it doesn't make sense. If you have this, Okay, you, let's say let's just assume uh, uniform zero one. Okay, I got hundred observations here. They'll be randomly selected around here. Okay, will be on average there'll be ten in each bin. Of, okay, now let's take two variables. Okay, I've still got hundred observations. It's still between zero and one. How many will be will be in each of the hundred bins? I start with hundred observations. One. Very simple. Okay, and this is the I mean, this is a simple case. You can say I have a and they're not uniform. Even worse. Okay. Okay. So basically, I start off with hundred. I did the ten bins with the average ten in each bin. I have two dimensions, still only hundred observations. They're jointly distributed, independently, totally uniform. Now there's a hundred cells. Okay. So I will have one per cell on average. When I get to three variables, how many will I have per cell? Bad news. <laughs> we got very few. We got most of these cells are sparse. So estimating likelihoods, estimating densities is going to be really, really hard. And this, everything breaks down here. Anyway, model selection. So how do you do, how do, you do model selection? AIC, BIC, Mallow, CP. <laughs> adjusted, adjusted, adjuster, 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 uh, R squared, because you have to take into account R squared will overfit. You'll overfit to the training set, okay? Because there's no there's no penalty for adding anything in for the training set. The training set is please, please, give me more so I can I can chase that point over there. Okay, we have to take into account the peak. That a p adding an extra variable will cost you something, and so we put in an adjusted r squared. It's kind of a little hokey, I think. Okay. Again, remember what we're really trying to get at in some regards is getting at the test MSC. That's what I said. The bias variance trade-off is not about the training in MSC or the training misclassification rate. It is the test misclassification rate. So what? How do we do model selection? Cross okay. <laughs> the only two things we talked about last time, bias variance and cross allocation. <laughs> okay, I like cross allocation because I just, I, again, I want a second technique. And if they don't agree, then I, I will think hard. I will go and check to see if do the cross validation correctly. Does it make sense? I look at the residuals of the cross validation and the actual samples and the way they were selected. And I will also look at the likelihood and I will say, oh, look, I believe the likelihood. Okay, but I will. I want to check. But if they both agree, I'm going fine. Okay, life is good. Okay, so cross validation is the you know is a good go to. It takes a little bit of complication, but not not bad. It really is quite simple, logistically quite simple. Um, 
And indeed, in many in, in certain simple cases, it is there's a formula for it where you can leave one out cross validation and it's just totally trivial. And in cross -val in generalized cross validation, it also works out very nicely. So there are nice simplifications to it, but all, again, easy for me to say, but computational time is probably not the concern for your scientific career. I don't mind being wrong. I just don't want to spend that extra hour waiting for the computer. Okay, so you're going to publish a paper with nonsense in it. It's probably, I've never heard anyone say that. Okay, so just do the extra computations. Another technique is not rigid regression, but it's regression. And it's a nice little trick, and hopefully you may have seen it before, and if not, I just wanted to cover it. Okay, again, I've got lots of dollar signs lying around and all this sort of stuff. Okay, rigid regression. Who knows about rigid regression? Two. Good. What's a fix? Probably written up there, but what's a fix? Don't read that. What's a fix? <laughs> Overfitting? Not really. Collinearity issues. Collinearity <laughs> issues. You know, if you read ahead, you're pointing and thinking, okay. <laughs> so the, the, the original, originally was motivated was that you actually have collinear excess. There's various things that go wrong with regression, regardless of what. So for now, we'll just assume x1 to xp could be squared value, they could be logs. They could, any transformation is now legitimate to be in there. We've got a bunch of x's that we're measuring on these things, but some of them could be collinear, collinear. They may be related to each other. So in other words, predict. So in other words, when I have height and weight and I'm using that to predict something else, well, height and weight are highly correlated. Okay, our age and income potentially, they may, they may be weakly correlated or not, but the more correlated they are, it's blatantly obvious that, uh, he said, I used to hate when people said that, but I'm older now, I can say <laughs> But yeah, when we have basically, when we say y is equal to beta zero plus beta one x one plus beta two x one over two, it's a stupid model, <laughs> okay? Because I, if I just if I just multiply this one by two and divide this one by two and vice versa, I get the same division. Yeah, that won't happen. So, but let's put a little error in here. So these are highly correlated, but they're not quite the same thing. But they're measuring the same thing. Likewise, I can just scale down beta two and scale up beta one, and I get the same answer. Yes, in the prediction, that won't happen. No, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll take the answer. <laughs> Happy now? Okay, the answer is if they're highly collinear. So basically, if these two are very, very close together, I haven't told you what error that's not like. So they're small. So they're, they're very highly correlated. Okay? There, so, you know, epsilon is 1% of x1. So it's really, really small. Well, you know, what's happening is basically these, these estimates are going to flip all over the place. I, 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 I get a sample. I get a sample n is equal to 100, let's say. I estimate this beta one hat is equal to 90, beta two, beta two hat is equal to 0 0.1. Okay? You get a different sample. You get a different, you, you, we just get the sample slightly differently as equal to 100. I can quite happily get this is equal to 45 and this is equal to whatever. Okay, this is equal to um, this is equal to 0.2. Okay, I can start getting stuff all together. This is a bit of a quick condition. No, but it's certainly going to affect my coefficient estimates. It's not going to necessarily affect prediction. So that's my model, and that's my goal. I don't care. Many times we're interested in coefficients. And one of the times we're interested in coefficients is, because people do this, is how do you figure out whether it should be in or should be out? You can use cross-validation, and that's not a bad thing to do, but some people have a problem. And it's a good thing, but, it's, but again, not all. Everything's a good thing, but within moderation and not with some knowledge. What some people do is they actually do t-tests. Okay, they do t-tests to decide, decide whether it's in or out. Okay, and that's fine. Okay, it's uh, and, and hopefully the standard error on this thing is enormous. So over it should be out. But no, one of them should be. <laughs> so you have a test that says both should be out. You take them out. You're missing something. So you put. Them back in again. <laughs> you can chase your tail around because you can't, because these are highly unstable. This comes along from x transpose x inverse that we like to compute or we compute what we like to do. Okay? Okay, this when you in the regression model, this is very, very close to okay, to non-invertible. Okay? If if 
you, you hopefully have seen this case where you actually have x1 and x1 again, okay, where you have a w variable and you have a constant, uh, and then you put an, an, uh, an intercept in as well. So there's two columns of ones, okay. They're, they're, it's high, it's non invertible in that case, okay. If you're worried about this, you can place and you can go off and look. This becomes essentially non invertible. So people figured out that this is numerically inaccurate to end up hideous thing that happens when the two column two columns or more to the point any combinations of columns are are basically linear uh, linear in relation to each other okay so it could be that x1 plus x2 is very similar to three times x7 plus one over uh, plus uh, plus point one times x2 okay and so forth and you can't really see it's not just like pairs of them relation but it's Multiplicity can be related. So this is this is a problem. So multicollinearity will lead to highly unstable betas. Doesn't change the prediction model. You're still getting essentially the same prediction. But that, and that's fine. If that's what we care about. In many cases, we're actually interested in inference. Remember, I did actually say this at the very beginning of my class. We're interested in prediction versus inference. Prediction is classification and prediction. Okay, and then this guy is inference. We're interested in the betas. Now, which one should I put in? Well, should I put in my height or my weight or both or some combination of the two? Probably a combination of the two, but I'll make it a single variable. But we end up with all sorts of problems here. Well, this is this is the part of the motivation for linear regression. What you actually do is you actually have you have this numerically unstable thing. So what people did was you have the diagonal and you inflate the diagonal. And that actually makes this more numerically stable. If you understand that, good for you. Okay. It's kind of an odd, it's kind of an odd explanation, but I, I believe that might have been the motivation. Let's just say what. Okay. Okay, but here's the here's a better motivation. Okay. Instead of actually minimizing the sum of squares, we're going to minimize the sum of squares with a penalty. We're not going to minimize just the sum of squares, we're going to minimize it's related to this, but not quite the same yet. Some tricks to this. We are going to minimize y minus x theta squared. That's just ordinary least squares. Okay? But we're going to say, I want to minimize this. And again, just, just to show you that this is linear, it's minimize with respect to theta, not x, plus lambda. What the heck lambda is? Okay? Coming over. Okay? The beta i squared. i is equal to 1 up to p. Okay? This is just a different loss function. Yes? Everyone happy? We're minimizing this. Okay? And you just go and search the betas for this. It's clear that if I make beta, if I make beta, beta i, if I make the betas huge, I, I can't win <laughs> over here. I mean, this is not going to offset them. But if I, make, if I make the betas work well here, okay, and these aren't too big, this will be small. And these are just huge betas, and this is, this is a large number of over, but this is not. Is this clear? This is penalized minimization. We're putting a penalty on the actual model. What should tell you to some extent is we're, we're reducing the flexibility of this model. Does that make sense? We're, we're trying to avoid a little bit. Okay, we're doing it. Are you? That's what I said. Okay, we just <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, fair enough. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Overfitting? It's not. It's not where it came from. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Fine. I apologize. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good point. Um, the, okay, but this is what we're actually it is reducing the flexibility. We're actually shrinking. We're basically going to end up shrinking these down. Okay, we're actually going to scale them down. Okay, we're going to basically they should be now. By 10, we're kind of bringing them down. If, we, if they were supposed to be at you know, 21, we get them down to 0.05 or whatever. I'm not making these numbers up entirely. But we're going to scale them down. Okay? This is a uh, wedge regression. It's penalized. We're penalizing the betas, the actual magnitude of betas. What's the variation of this? We talk about loss functions. What's an obvious loss function to change this to? I mean, this, this works just fine. Okay, by the way, while you're thinking about that, I just want to, uh, I, I, 
the end of this, the number of characters I need to change here is three. Okay? To actually do what I'm thinking. But by the way, I've got an extra variable in here. Not just the betas. It's also with respect to lambda. I can minimize with respect to lambda. That's true. Okay? Every beta that I get, every I get a collection of beta 0, beta 1, beta 2, up to beta p. And again, how I select these betas, uh, how, how I put the x's in, we'll get there in a second. How I decide, but these all depend on lambda. For a different lambda, I will get a different set of betas. Okay? If you want to think about this, if we're lucky, here's lambda, and here's going to be my beta. This, for a very small version of lambda, beta 1, might look like this, and as we increase lambda, it goes like this. And as beta 2 might go up, might start like this and go down and come over here. Beta 3 might start up here and come down and go over here. By the way, they're all converging on something because they have to start getting down closer to zero. Okay? You can draw a zero in here. Some of them might start off in negative, but then they start coming towards zero because I'm putting a huge penalty on the size of them. Okay? The bigger you are, the, the more I'm going to come against you and actually take some away from you. There's a penalty here. Okay, so we will do this. For each lambda, I will get a different value of betas. All the, all the betas will flow together. Okay, and they will come on and they will be close to zero because when lambda is infinity, these will, the, that, this is the dominant force. Okay, this is true, this is infinity, <coughs> that's the cost. Okay, yeah? So, you have a question about this lambda exactly? It's a penalty. It's a, and one can, one can think about it. Maybe I'm going to just try out a term just to get you thinking. I'm not going to explain it because I'm not sure that, that I'm not going to explain it. But you can think about this in some way. It's, it's the degree of the penalty, the effect of how long, how much it's, it's a learning rate in some way. It's, it's related in some way. It's, it's a trade off between the bias and the variance. Okay? Because as we, as, we, as we restrict the betas, we're not able to capture the features in our curve. You have a curve that looks like this, we're basically saying, no, you can't, you can only get up, you can only, you can only capture certain aspects of these, okay? Think about this, if I actually killed one of these off to zero, I wouldn't be able to capture the, the, the actual quadratic nature, the cubic nature here. I would actually be biasing this, but I'm minimizing the variance, okay, me. If I actually choose the right value of lambda, I'm going to choose the right value of lambda through cross validation. Okay, maybe. Okay, that's one way of doing it, just like we talked about with C and other things like that. Okay, so if we get this picture, okay, these will shrink down. We're basically scaling them down because we, as we increase this, we basically want this term to sort of have to, with some ink down, very informally. As we increase, as we increase this value, these will scale these guys down. So this term is constant to, to some extent. But we're going to trade this off. I, I'll, let, I'll let the betas get bigger so this gets smaller. After, they, after this stops getting smaller, then this starts getting bigger as the beta drops. So I can trade this off. So I'm just moving around. Again, we're searching around the, the values of beta to um, find this. By the way, this is penalized mean squares. And I can turn this around into saying, Minimize this subject to uh, subject to lambda, so not lambda, beta i squared is less than some. Say this is mathematically equivalent to the same thing, okay? Which now makes it a Lagrangian multiplier problem, constrained optimization problem that we have right here, okay? Same problem, very much like the support vector machines. We've got a constrained problem. Okay, and these are mathematically equivalent. So change, let me change the loss function. And by the way, I'm going to change the loss function. I asked you to think about it. You can randomly guess as to what three characters I'm going to change. They want to be simple, they're not characters. But I will say this, I was very careful to say beta one up to beta p, all depend because this guy here, and I'm very careful about this guy. Do not penalize the intercept. The intercept is the mean. Do not penalize it. Do not shrink that down. <laughs> okay? So we're only penalizing the actual predictors, not the overall mean. What characters would I like to change to make this a more intuitive loss function? Not, not this one. This is kind of getting us into this is this is our prediction. So what will I change? I 
I never understood why we, I know why, I, I, well, I'm not saying it. I understand why we do this, because it's, because when we take derivatives, we can take derivatives of squares, okay? And everything becomes nicely differentiated and life is good. But I always, whenever I started looking at statistics the first time, from a mathematical point of view, why don't you take the absolute value? Um, it's the same thing. You can take the square root, the square, the square root, take the absolute value. We put squares in here, it, and we know that this actually is heavily influenced by outliers. So they get magnified too much. This is a much nicer way of doing it. So we couldn't, we can't differentiate this. We can't compute. You had real trouble back in the 60s and 70s computing this stuff. Now we can. So this seems in some ways to be a more natural loss function. Okay, we're just we're penalizing the betas. So let me just change that. And then a magical piece comes out. So now we do the same thing. Let's write this down. This is lambda beta by i is equal to one, i squared up to p. We do this. And I can write an equivalent version here, which is lambda, different lambda, sum of the beta i's with the absolute value of this. Anyone know how to solve that? It's a Grunge multiplier problem. We have an idea that it's slightly different and so forth, and we can fix this. It turns out to have a very nice little solution. And here's a nice picture. If you worry, if you're trying to figure this out again, again, I'm playing. This is true, but I'm going to be very heuristic about this. What we've actually got is here. Here we've got two, got two variables. This is not x1, not x2. This is beta1 and beta2. This is how we do the optimization. When we do it through calculus or when we do it in software, you're going to see this. It's useful to know what you're actually doing. Okay, if I choose beta1 and beta2 down here as 0 and 0, I'm way off here. Okay, this is, I do terrible optimization. I just predict the average. So I move up a little bit and go to here. Okay, and then I move over to here, and move over to here. And I constantly chase the loop of the, I constantly chase my residual sum of squares. Okay, so we have a closed form solution. Don't need these two pieces. We have a closed form solution for this, and it turns out that it's over here, let's say. Okay, it's x transpose x inverse x transpose y. Much better. Okay? And then somebody comes along and says, I'm doing ridge regression. That means your solution is no longer useful. Okay? I'm going to tell you lambda is two, okay? Okay, or well, more to the point, I'm going to take this. I, I, anyone, does anyone not believe me that these two are equivalent? Minimize, minimize this plus this, or minimize this subject to this condition. Anyone want to argue with me about this? Good, thank you. <laughs> okay, so they are the same. So let's just take this term, okay? Subject to beta i squared is less than c. What does that look like? I'm allowed beta 1 go up to c. Beta 1 squared is less than c, which means that I'm allowed to go up to root c here. Beta 2 can be 0, and beta 1 can be over here. Beta 2 can be root c, but then beta 1 has to be 0. And otherwise, it's a Okay? That is my constraint. I have to be inside this. Okay? If this happened to be the OLS, the order of these squares, value, I don't, there's no constraint, I'm done, okay, there's no problem. If this though was my ordinary least square solution, this is not a solution. So I'm gonna to have to relax this, I'm gonna to have to actually say, well give me a beta which or where the residual sum of squares goes up, but that is here. So you might think about this as being, I'm gonna draw it this way, because it makes it much easier, okay. You will actually draw it here, that's my so I'm gonna run out of force, so I'm gonna draw. <laughs> okay, so we draw this. These are, let's just say, this is a complete, I'm playing fast and loose with clips to make my life convenient. Okay, this is going to be the contours of my residual sum of squares. Okay, this is the RSS. This one is best, this one is less best, this one is less good again, but at least they're getting close to this because I don't have a feasible solution. I have to be in here. So I will just go over here, and I will eventually hit here. And that is my solution. Everyone happy? So this is constrained optimization. These are what we're looking over. We, we literally, if we had, if this computer could do this. It just divides betas up until it's through and searches and computes the 
computes this term, computes this term, adds them together, and then finds the minimum, and searches all, searches through that. Let's take this guy. It's a constraint, just like this one, isn't it? I can work, I trust me. <laughs> I can read out the sum. It's minimize this such that this is less than less than C. Different C. C. So what does that look like? It looks like a diamond, doesn't it? It looks like a line. Okay. Beta one, beta one can be C. Okay, so this is stem C. So they're on a different scale because one's squared and the other's not squared. So it's like beta two can be C. And it's a line that actually, remember here, it's this guy here, and this guy here. And for some reason, I keep drawing this too high. Okay. And if I draw this, we're up here again, we do the same thing. I get a circle, and I get a circle. What is the difference? It's a magic piece. What is the difference between this and this as I've drawn it intentionally to illustrate the point and not because it happened all the time, but it happened a lot more often than it should? So it was just a chance. The nature of these constraints, the boundaries on these constraints, do what? I'll give you a hint. It's to do with model selection. Whether something should be in or out. And we have this guy up here. Imagine they're concentric circles. Okay. Or not. They could be ellipses. They, they don't even have to be. Notice this. The intersection that I've drawn here is at zero. It is at beta one zero. And over here, was, this bit was sticking out. So I actually got an intersection here. As I went over here, I draw the same line, the same same thing over here. You see, it's below this point. Whereas this point then actually gives me a higher residual sum of squares, a lower residual sum of squares, should I say. So this point is to be preferred than this point over here. Okay, does that make sense? If this is not clear, please yell. Does it make sense to anyone? So the magical trick is, it is there's a good chance because of this linear constraint as opposed to this quadratic curve here that sticks out too much, okay? There's a better chance that one of the values for beta will be exactly zero, not close to zero, exactly zero, so we'll drop it from the model. So this curve that I drew here, now starts going, and this is zero, and this, these ones will come close to zero, and as lambda gets bigger and bigger, they'll get infinitely close to zero, as the penalty increases. But they will never become zero because we're, we're dividing by some number. Whereas what's happening here, again, now, we're not going to now. Okay, but what's actually going to happen with this solution is we're going to end up shrinking beta 1 and beta 2 down. We're going to take a little bit off the true value of beta 1, or not the true, but the unconstrained version of beta 1. We're going to subtract off some value. And we're going to subtract off some value from here too. So that if this was the true, if this was going to be the true value for beta, we bring it down to here. Okay, I agree with that. But in some case, okay, so here we scale for the original regression, we scale, we divide the coefficient by a number. Here we subtract off a number, a linear transformation. And what's even weirder is if beta i is greater than some number, we subtract off something. If beta i is less than some number, we, okay, so betas are here and here, okay? If it's less than this, we add some number to actually bring it closer to zero. If it's over here, we, do, we subtract some number to bring it closer to, we're shrinking it to zero, closer to zero. If it's in this magic region, we make it identical to zero, and then it drops out, because this is a model selection technique. It actually drops X's out of the model and says that one's no longer there. Okay, which means you don't have to carry it around. It's a piece of magic because of the math. Again, it's a, lot, a different loss function. Let's say three characters, okay? Take away the square, take away the square, and then two vertical bars. That's, you just changed it. But it's mathematically quite different because of these pictures, okay? It has a different solution, it should illustrate my God. You can actually do quite different things with different loss functions, okay? But all of a sudden, it becomes a model selection technique, okay? 
it breaks down the very large high dimensions as, as most things do, but you are actually controlling the wheels. Okay, this thing is chasing. This thing will chase around if you let it and try to overfit. We're putting a penalty on here. We're putting a different penalty on here. It's all different mathematical details. So what's the next stage? Because by God, this is reasonably obvious. This is obviously motivated by. <laughs> There's various reasons for, uh, for uh, this makes sense. Mathematically, is easy. This makes sense because we can do absolute values now, kind of in various different ways. This is all well and good. Okay, so what's the so they are kind of it's a nice progression, partially computational, partially make, partially just makes sense, partially breakthroughs. The blue states also can be motivated by these. What's the next step? Hmm? Well, you, if you have to choose lambda, if you've always got to choose lambda, we've always got to actually sort of use, use some technique, but there's another tech. So, people, so it's statisticians, academic statisticians, just sit there and make up new methods and, and, and try to prove that they're better or that they don't work in this thing. So, how do, what, what can we do to go one step beyond either of these? Put them both together. <laughs> okay. And then probably put another term in. We can using this and this, and this is the thing called the elastic net. Okay, and so, okay, so you can go, you know, with the same idea, just penalizing the squares. I've actually people were doing penalizing these squares a long time before these guys were around, through when they were doing things with splines. They were controlling wheels in splines and in polynomial regression and so forth. So this is, it's, it's actually an evolution that's pretty natural, okay, but, it, but we now understand that they can do better and has much better uh, motivation. That's why I'm actually saying that. This now makes sense from an overfitting point of view, but when it was originally created, it was merely to avoid collinearity. Um, but now we actually have a much better understanding. So this is kind of, this is probably you know, this is the newest thing in regression. Regression has been around for a while. So it's the following reasonable characterization. Suppose I've got hundred variables that I throw in the regression. Right. One way to do it would be to start with one. And Two or three, and use cross validation to tell me what to stop. Right? Yeah. Another way would be this lasso where if I just put in all 100, and then my cross validation is going to be to get me down to 10 versus 10. Yeah. Tom? Comments? Anyone? You've got two scenarios. You've got to pick. So you're basically saying, Put the 100 variables and you use cross validation to get to find out which ones you should put in. Or, or you just use the lasso. Are you, doing, are you actually, are you, you're talking about stepwise selection? We can use stepwise selection okay. yes, with so cross validation. So stepwise selection. Okay, so that means, and remember, you have two ways to do stepwise selection stepwise selection and cross validated. It, you do the whole thing for each fold. Or, <laughs> Basically, you do your stepwise selection and then do cross validation at the end. Which is which is better? <laughs> I'll give you a hint. Not the second. <laughs> okay, that's the whole, that's the one we were talking about earlier. Which is like I'm not repeating what I actually did. I'm repeating the outcome of what I did, having optimized my selection. So that'll be that. So we have to do the first one. It's not a big calculation. Hundred variables. Okay, so so we do the stepwise selection. You're doing forward stepwise selection. Why are there the next way? You can do both. I, can't, I, I, I was just talking about this yesterday. I haven't had a moment, I haven't had a moment to think about it. But I always remember that uh, my, so I did my PhD down in Berkeley and there was a guy called Terry Steed, who's a famous statistician. And actually, I, my, my first year in my PhD, he was teaching this class. And, just, and I can't remember which one it was, but it's forward or stepwise is just broken conceptual. One of them is just a ridiculous concept. It works, <laughs> but, it, but logically, doesn't make any sense. So there is this thing, like it's an engineering principle. These make sense, but a lot of the, the probability numbers that makes are is somewhat dubious. Uh, so yeah, and then likewise, when you get into high dimensions, 100, I think you're okay on the last. So I think you'll probably get there. You just go off and you crap across all day. But then, how, you know, how how do we go? Of course, we have two methods. <laughs> and this is back to my safety thing. We got two methods. They're just computer time. So if they give you totally different answers, what will we do? I am punting on that. <laughs> what would we do if they give you totally different answers? 
Well, they give, how could they give you different answers? And what are we trying to minimize? Prediction? Colin hasn't told us whether we're interested in prediction or inference. So that matters. And if they come back and they, if they come back and they're the same mo they're the same X's in both worlds, do we care? If we're interested in inference? And if they don't, we can start looking at why. And again, I mean, there's a huge amount of data analysis that goes on after the methods have come back and actually taken a look. And again, this is my this is my way of a hunting and b also. But I I, I, I wouldn't sleep I wouldn't sleep quiet at night. I wouldn't sleep any worse at night. <laughs> but yeah, um, uh, you know, but I would I want to see why that they're different because they may there may be valuable trace traces of suggestions as to what we can actually do. Um, but it. But I, I, I do, you, do you buy the, 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 the forward and backward selection? Does it work? I mean, you, you were nodding, but they're kind of logically. Well, <laughs> so, um, the big thing, probably economics and other areas, is to, is to use those. So. Yeah. I, I mean, but, it doesn't, but the selection thing, because this, I mean, the thing I like about this, it's not, it's not based on testing. You know, and there's a whole other thing, and you're doing all these multiple tests going through the border selection, and you get the collinearity going on, and all the wacky things. It's just like, you know, and then there's, you get, I mean, the, the, the hybrid version of forward and forward and backwise, it all makes sense, but think, the thing about doing multiple testing, oh my god, you have to test, and again, that question about PD.05, in the process of going through my selection, I've made now about a thousand decisions. Okay, you know, like, okay, I'll blow my, my career question on the normal and on these fronts on if the nulls are, if there's no relationship. So it's kind of a little bit weird. I, so, yeah, so, but, but, but in the economics they're using the lasso? Well, in economics, what people are using for is where you have one Y, one X you're interested in. And a lot of other X's. Yeah. And you've got so many, you want to reduce the dimensionality of those. Yeah. And they're using the lasso um, that. Right. And, and, and these other things are just controls. Right? We don't care particularly what their coefficients are. The only inference we want to do is on single yep. X. Yeah. Exactly. I, I, I mean, it's a, I don't know, it's a, this is the snag. I mean, the statistics doesn't really solve it. You're going to give you a lot hard answer on this. But of course, there's this other issue which we were about. I didn't get to, which is, I know the answer. I think I know the answer to this is why don't you actually reduce the dimension before you get to there and actually do PCA or something? I see what I'm saying. So people need to leave. But just one question on my side. After we've picked the exits, yeah, right. Should we go with the lasso estimates or do OLS on the variables that have been selected? So should we finally do analysis with the penalty on the coefficients imposed or not? Uh, yes. Uh, what do you think? I mean, what, what do you I'm mean? not sure. What, what do you People learn any economics that tend to use to go back and just not use the penalty. So they call that post lasso. I, I, I have a, I, I have a, I have a sympathy for that because you have, you have, you have, the purpose here is to uh, is to avoid the overfitting, and you've done that, so you, now you can go back. Um, but of course, now you've actually changed the. I mean, in terms of cross validation and everything, you've changed the prediction error. <laughs> so uh, it's it's a, it's a it's a tricky one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> and there is this whole other issue, by the way. Just uh, just. Uh, uh, which we didn't get to, which is unsupervised learning. So this is like one trick is to actually do what well, couple of talking about, about x1 and all these other x. So those two dimensions of actually, of course, that becomes you've lost your x1, so you can no longer do x4. So you're not doing inference about the same thing. And I, I you were saying that I, I was skeptical about unsupervised. I, I didn't mean to be at all. I think I suspect I might have. I certainly didn't mean to be skeptical about everything. When we started last day, I said there's three things. There's supervised learning. Unsupervised learning and semi supervised learning, and the variations within that. Semi supervised learning, I think, was where I was, where I was saying, and then there's this magic that happens, okay? And it can go right or it can go wrong. But the unsupervised stuff is great. This is clustering and uh, dimension reduction and all sorts of interfaces where we don't have a Y. We just don't, we have a whole lot of X's. Any of them could be a Y, 
but we have no question about the about a particular why. We're just interested in finding groups for marketing purposes or just for just for exploratory data analysis and so forth. And there's all sorts of different variations of clustering. For semi-supervised learning, it's a fun, it's a fun, interesting area where you basically have Ys. You have two data sets essentially. You have Ys and Xs. And you've got another data set with just Xs. Okay? So you've got a whole lot of samples. Let's say you have 200 observations. Half of them, let's say, or 25% or whatever, have Ys, and the others not. They're essentially missing values. The question is, you know, if you think about it, when you state it like that and they're missing values, can we actually infer the Ys? In which case, then, we potentially can afford them. If, if we were able to nail the, uh, if, we had, if we were trying to do classification, we got zero classification errors on the 25% for which we have the Ys, why not just go off and actually classify the remaining 75%? Assume they're correct because we got no no misclassification error, and now you've got a much bigger data. <laughs> okay, now you've actually got so you're you're doing prediction, but then what we can do is actually wander back and actually augment our uh, data set, and then start fitting again. And you can imagine now if that works, you're basically reinforcing your learning, and if it's wrong, you're reinforcing your misled. <laughs> okay, so you can be you can go wrong very. So it depends, it depends, that's where I might have been marginally skeptical. Okay. Supervised, uh, unsupervised learning is just terrific and it's just messy, but it's a whole different set of goals that we're actually trying to do. And it's primarily dimension reduction and um, clustering and that sort of stuff, but we didn't actually have language. We just want to be able to say these two, these two things are different. So I didn't mean to uh, in any way be skeptical or demean unsupervised learning whatsoever. Uh, and there's lots of fun stuff to be doing, and there's variations of clustering algorithms that have been developed. There's a lot of stuff that's going on now. Statistics was kind of grinding away very slowly for a long time, and all of a sudden it started accelerating because lots of people came in from machine learning, from CS, from various different fields, and said, Hey, I got different questions. And of course, we haven't even started even remotely talking about spatial time series, all sorts of entertainment stuff. It's huge. Um, if you have any thoughts, comments, please let me know. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, this, is, this is our just five hours of machine learning. So we will teach classes on this. <laughs> so is this the gist about the linear highway problems of, uh, of inference of linear regression because of flow in the air and that can get better inference? Uh, yeah, because you're going to stabilize the, you know, in this case, you're going to basically sort of, you're, you're going to stabilize these coalition estimates. Uh, you're going to stabilize this, and then here you're doing the same thing, but you're also getting the benefit of all these questions where some of them will drop out. Again, collinearity things can just, if you're interested in the data, they can just go all over them. Right. You know, it also carries, like, I'm all wondering about that. Why do we always square the differences? You can take the room. <laughs> 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 <laughs>